All right, so coming up is uh, Councilwoman Bailey, Councilman Roth, and our Mayor, Steve Losner. And they are going to help me with the presentations because they represent some key folk in this town, uh, including the Rotary Club of Homestead, this is for the Kids Inc., and uh, the Arts Walk, who have participated with the Kiwanis Club of Homestead to sponsor some of your organizations and uh, get sports back to um, an important place in our culture and our, our town here in Homestead. So first up, we want to recognize AYSO and all of their all-star uh, kids who made it to the all-star teams. You all were selected amongst your peers to play in representing All-Star and AYSO. And I'm going to read your names. And what we're going to do is just have you come up and take a group picture with um, your coaches. So the coaches, if you can come on up. We have the 10 and under girls, Coach Sarah White Parks. If you're here, please join us. And Emily is here from the Kiwanis Club of Homestead South Day. Please come up and join us and participate in these presentations. Jaylin Flores, Amia Godsey, Kaylen Parks, Abigail Saucedo, and if you're here, just come on in, and we'll take a group picture with your team. Zimena Carranza, Lea Lorenzo, Chiara Espinal, Victoria Tronter, Idison Ramos, Angelique Ortiz and Brianna Mendez. That is the group from 10 New Girls with AYSO. So if they're not here, please, when you see them, give them a round of applause for being part of AYSO's all-star team. <laughs> 10 New Boys with Coach Omar Campusano. All right. Thank you, Coach, for being here. And under your team, All-Stars, we have Rafael Herrera, Aiden Bonilla, Bradley Baskin, Omar Campusano, Angel Rodriguez, Kane Velasquez, Carlos Solorzano, Ethan Gonzalez, Dylan Ruiz, and Miguel Am Sequita, Am Esquita. Okay. You look great in your uniforms. All right, next up we have the 12 U girls. You're going to stay there, okay? Huh? You want them to move over? Yeah, that's fine. Yep, for the photography. 10, 12 U girls. We've got with Coach Bo Sponseller. Great job, coaches. We've got assistant coach Jeremy Patrick. You can get right next to them. Wherever you feel comfortable. Yeah. Assistant coach Nelson Apolinario. Alina Campos. Starting with our players, Alina. Melanie Perez. Sofia Hernandez. Nevea Santos Reyes. Chloe Gonzalez, Catherine Perez, Emma Enriquez, Cassidy Sponseller, Mia Porven, Addison Apolinario, Natalia Thompson, and Isabella Pena with the 12U girls team. All right, making more room because you guys are a big crowd. That's awesome. 14 and under girls, Coach Nelson Ducos. <laughs> with assistant coaches Omar Campusano and assistant coach Joshua Brady. And the players were Paige Zambrano, Isabella Quintana, Ellie Rose Gomez. Brissa Hernandez, Alexia Almeida, Delaila Saavedra, Bianca Munoz, Navea Brady, come right in front, Leilani Luna, 
Adrian Bayuyo, Sofia Campuzano, and Alexandra Mendez. And there's another Alexandra Mendez on the list. <laughs> okay, come on up. Right here in front. Congratulations. Wow. All right. Then we have for the 14 and under boys with Coach Lonnie Allen and those players, oh, and assistant coach Luis Rivera. And those players are Ryan De La Rosa, Gavin Allen, Devin Delgado, Andre Jaramillo, and Manuel Cruz Hernandez, Ramsey Chavaria Calvo, Yeshua Chavaria Calvo, Rigoberto Amesquita, Santiago Rodriguez, Nathan Osterman, Luis Rivera, Emilio Mollinedo, Daniel Munoz, and Hansel Rodriguez. Get in the front, guys. Get in the front. Over here. Over here. Right here. Like, make a little in this pocket here. All right. And then the last list for AYSO. I'm so proud of you guys. You guys are awesome. For the HS High School, is that what that says? High School Boys, Coach Noe Jimenez. With assistant coach Ramiro Samudio. Samudio. And the players are Adrian De La Rosa, David De La Rosa, Noe Jimenez, Zachary Allen. I'm going to sit over here. JC Allen, Sebastian Mosqueda, Daniel Zamudio. Aikendorf Joseph, I hope I said that right. Luis Dennis, Logan Zambrano, Christopher Resende, Jose Zapata, Juan Pablo Santana, Alejandro Arzate, Inti Pesquiera, Eduardo Medina, and Lex Lopez. Did I call everyone in the room? Sammy, get up there, Sam. And I'd like all of the other AYSO volunteers and uh, coaches, if you were not called, please still come up and join. You guys play an integral role in making these practices and these playoffs and these things happen. So thank you. So what I have for AYSO is this certificate for the 2021 All-Stars in recognition of their selection as All-Stars among their peers to represent AYSO Region 805 in tournaments throughout Florida in 2021, in addition to their time and dedication as volunteers for their region. The City of Homestead applauds you, presented this 18th day of August 2021 by Councilwoman Erica Avila, Mayor and Council. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm extremely proud of these kids. Um, again, they're selected amongst their peers, but not just because of their skills on the field, but also because of what they contribute to our region. Um, they're all kind of um, asked weekly to be uh, volunteer referees, which is not easy. A lot of these faces, when they see us, picking up. They're there to ask for, you know, to help us out and give us a hand. Uh, and it means a lot to us. A special shout out to the um, high school boys, if you guys can kind of raise your hands over there. These guys have been together and have been a part of the region since a lot of them were seven, six and seven years old. They have, uh, they have made it to the finals and to the championship in every tournament that they have joined in the last year. Um, and uh, they, they were de definitely the most decorated, as you can see all the medals on them. Um, but uh, the, what's important is a lot of the kids here are missing. There's a couple that are uh, attending college on scholarships. Um, and these kids, we've watched them grow into young men and represent us and help us in every way possible. And I hope to still see you guys around um, coming by whenever you can. But for everyone else, our season's about to start. We got 500 kids that joined. We expect, like always, for you guys to be leaders on your teams now, okay? And to help those kids that might not be all-stars and show them and help them along the way and keep doing what you're doing, okay? Coaches, awesome job. You're the backbone of this region. Without you, it wouldn't be possible. Um, the, the hours of dedication and what you guys do and mean to these kids, you might not realize it, but it's leaving a lifelong impression. 
So we thank you for, for that. Thank you guys very much. Have a good evening. Congratulations, Sammy. All right, guys, you can take a seat. We're going to get on to the next because we do have a council meeting at 6. I'm going to try to get through these quickly. But first up, we're going to start with uh, Homestead Youth Baseball Team South Dade Blue Jays with eight and under. So you're up next. If the coaches for Jeremy Ellenberg, who's being presented with 2021 Summer's Most Improved Player, is he in the house? Huh? Oh, they're at a game. Ah, mejor. All right. May they win. So that's it. So Jaden Ellenberg as well, right? Okay. We're going to put those aside for them. But Jaden, Jeremy won Most Improved Player, and Jordan was Summer MVP. Let's hear it for them. All right. Going into Team Pink Storm. And Miss Yvonne Knowles with the Seroptimus Club, could you help me present these? So Pink Storm and Black Storm, this is the new Homestead softball team that was created here in Homestead this summer with the help of the Seroptimus Club, the Kiwanis Club, this is for the Kids Inc., as well as the Rotary Club of Homestead. And Miss Bailey made a great effort in helping to help us improve the, the parks at J.D. Red. Remember that grass project, all that new grass that keeps the flooding from happening? You can thank Ms. Bailey for that as well. All right, so for 2021 summer, most improved player goes to, for Team Pink Storm, Jaden Tapenes. Then we have for 2021 summer MVP, Mia Morales. And then best all-around player, Riley Hope Eclair. And we'll send this with the other coaches since they're not here to collect. All right. And then we have for Team Black Storm coming up for summer MVP, Ms. Kaylee Orta. If you're here, come on up. Then we have 2021 Summer Best All-Around Player, Miss Kathy Lisa Betts. Could you hand this to Kaylee, please? All right, this one is for Kathy. Hand that to Kathy for me. And then for 2021 Summer Most Improved Player, Brianna Cuellar. Cuellar. If we can have the coaches and the rest of the team players that are here with Black Storm to come on up and take a group picture. Congratulations, ladies. You have, you have made us very proud starting off first season and already going to the championships. Is that correct? Yes. These ladies are going to the championships, ladies and gentlemen. All right, show your awards, face them forward. Thank you. And we have two little ladies here on the Pink Storm team, 11 and under. And so I'm going to present this, these extra ones to you. So you can make sure they get to their owners, okay? And Coach Dad is the coach for 11U right here, Arnold Perez. All right, and we've got for Team Canes with Homestead Youth Baseball, if they're in the house, summer 2021 VIP, Frank Viera, is he here? 
Yeah. Larry. Larry. And then for best all around player, Victor Santos. Is he here? No? All right. We got a picture with you. All by yourself. Look how special. Congratulations. Mayor, I think he wants you to get closer. Thank you. Congrats. You want to give you want to take this one for Victor? You want to go ahead and take that one to Victor. Do you mind? You okay with that? I have Nathaniel Torres right here. Sorry I missed it. Woo. Congratulations, Nathaniel. Right, right. Yep, you got it. You know where to go. Congratulations. So I have um, an award for one of our last coaches. I thought it was very important that we recognize this individual. Uh, unfortunately, uh, she passed away last week. She was one of our local coaches at the Homestead Little League. And I have here Michelle Loomis and her sister, Coach Becky's sister and nephew. So this is for the Tigers team. Coach Becky, in recognition of her contribution as a valued board member and dedication as a coach, sharing five years of service, support, and passion for promoting youth baseball within our community, the city of Homestead applauds her. Thank you for accepting this. And so these last awards, they're not for players who go out and kick the dirt and hit the ball, but they're fighting for, for you all to continue on with your sports and to make sure that these things continue. And so I thought it was appropriate that we recognize them and that they hear your round of applause when we call their name. So this certificate is to the Sir Optimist of Homestead in dedication and recognition of your commitment to serving children. And Larry Roth will accept the one for This Is For The Kids, Inc. in recognition of bringing softball back to Homestead. Yes. <laughs> Emily Guzman, president of the Kiwanis of Homestead South Dade. Thank you. And Mayor Lozner will accept on behalf of Rotary Club of Homestead for help. You're welcome. And that's a wrap. So thank you, councilmen and women. Thank you to AYSO, Homestead Youth Baseball, Pink, Storm Pink, Black T Pink, all the teams in here. Thank you for coming. Have a great evening and be safe out there. Keep it up. Have a great first day of school, everybody. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. This is the City of Homestead City Council meeting. Today is Wednesday, August 18th, 2021, and it is 6.06 .06 p.m. The city will hold a hybrid council meeting. The public may participate in person at City Hall or virtually utilizing video conference via WebEx events or the toll-free conference call number. Please go to cityofhomestead.com slash calendar for specific details and instructions on participation utilizing video and telephonic conferencing. The meeting can also be viewed live on the City Access Channel or City website at cityofhomestead.com. Public comments can be made in person at the meeting or emailed to public comments at cityofhomestead.com. Written public comments are limited to 300 words per comment, and written public comments on specific agenda items should include your name, address, the item you, you would like to comment on, and your comment. And it can be submitted by noon on Tuesday, August 17th, 2021, and will be included in the minutes. Written public comments on general matters should also include your name, address, and your comment, 
and may be submitted up to, until 30 minutes after the end of the council meeting and will be included in the minutes. Please rise and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic in which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Shelley? Here. Councilwoman Bailey? Here. Councilman Fletcher? Here. Council Councilwoman Avila? Here. Councilman Roth? Here. Vice Mayor Fairclaude Staggers? Mayor Lozner? Here. Thank you. Madam Manager, are there any additions, deletions, or deferrals? Yes, Mr. Mayor, there are two deferrals, tabs 15 to 23, Horton Parker Point Project, and tabs 24 to 27, PJC Investments, Keys Lake. These are being de deferred as the applications were incomplete when the agenda went out. Specifically, neither application had provided the requisite public school concurrency tri-party agreement, without which, in accordance to our city code, these items cannot go forward. But fortunately for the applicants, these are being deferred to a date certain next week, August 26th, for which there is already a notice special call rather than having to wait until the September council meeting, which is not until September 29th. Thank you. Do we need a motion, formal motion, and vote to defer? We do jointly? Yes. All right. I'll entertain a motion to defer the two items as uh, announced by the city manager. Moved by Councilman Roth. Second. Second by Councilman Avila. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. All right, next item. Four, our consent agenda, tabs one through six. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Moved by Councilman Roth. Second by Councilman Shelley. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Any nays? Thank you. All right, next item, five, public hearings, ordinances, land use items, et cetera. Mr. White. Yes, please be advised the following items on the agenda are quasi-judicial in nature. If you wish to comment upon any of these items, please indicate the item number you would like to address when the announcement regarding the quasi-judicial item is made. An opportunity for persons to speak on each item will be made available after the applicant and staff have made their presentations on each item. Swearing in, all testimony, including public testimony and evidence, will be made under oath or affirmation. Additionally, each person who gives testimony may be subject to cross-examination. If you do not wish to either be cross-examined or sworn, your testimony will be given its due weight. The general public will not be permitted to cross-examine witnesses, but the public may request the council to ask questions of staff or witnesses on their behalf. The full agenda packet on each item is hereby entered into the record. Persons representing organizations must present evidence of their authority to speak for the organization. Further details of the quasi-judicial procedures may be obtained from the clerk. In accordance with Code Section 2-591, any lobbyist must register before addressing the council on any of the following items. At this time, I'd ask council members to disclose any ex parte communications uh, they've had concerning any of the items on the quasi-judicial agenda this evening. Thank you. Mr. Shelley? Uh, yes, I spoke with the applicants uh, on tabs 7 through 14. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Councilwoman Bailey? Same for me. Councilwoman Avila? Same for me. Item 7 through 14 on the Homestead Pavilion issues. Council Fletcher? Yes, uh, same tab, 7 through 14. Thank you. Thank you. Did the Vice Mayor join us yet? No. All right. All right, Mr. White, tab 7. Yes. Uh, what? Need to swear before before we proceed, yes, Mayor. At this time, I'd ask the clerk to swear in any persons who wish to testify in the quasi-judicial items. So anyone in the audience who's wishing to speak on the quasi-judicial items, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn by the clerk. Do you hereby swear or affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? So help me God. Thank you. You may be seated. 
uh, Mayor and Council, the first item for consideration this evening on the quasi-judicial uh, agenda is tab seven. It's a proposed rezoning. However, um, we need to hear tab 28, which is the first reading of an ordinance, a legislative matter, which is the proposed future land use map amendment, which is the corresponding application. I can introduce both of those. You can have a collective discussion, public hearing, and then take a vote first on the comp plan amendment, followed by the rezoning. Let's do that. So tab 28 is the first reading of an ordinance of the city of Homestead, Florida, amending the comprehensive future land use map designation requested by Atlanta Corporation for an approximately 17.6 acre parcel of land from the light commercial use LCU to the neighborhood mixed use NMU for property generally located at north, north of Maui Drive, east of North Homestead Boulevard, south of Harris Field, west of Northeast 12th Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. Back to tab seven. Tab seven under quasi-judicial is the first reading of an ordinance of the city of Homestead, Florida, approving the rezoning requested by Atlanta Corporation of an approximately 17.61 acre parcel of land from the restricted retail commercial B1 zoning district to the neighborhood mixed use NMU zoning district for property generally located north of Maui Drive, east of North Homestead Boulevard, south of Harris Field, west of Northeast 12th Avenue as legally described in Exhibit A, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. This is first reading. Thank you. Um, did we want to take all of the items that are related to this as, as one? The, you need to do those two first. These are the Atlanta Corporation first, and then there are several items related okay. to Homestead Pavilion. Very good. All right, Mr. Cordino. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, on both of, of these, the, the comp plan amendment and the zoning, staff is recommending approval of, of both. Uh, effectively, what we're doing is re-land using from light commercial use to neighborhood mixed use. And all of, the, all of the issues that go with it right now, the light commercial use is implemented by B1, B1A, B2, excluding automobile type uses, heavy auto uses. The NMU, or the uh, neighborhood mixed use, is implemented by similar B1A, B1, um, uh, GP, uh, also RT&D, which is uh, traditional neighborhood development, and neighborhood mixed use. The land use category in neighborhood mixed use uh, has some, got some caveats on it. it, it the category shall not exceed 70% uh, for the residential portion, nor 30% for the office commercial portion. Right now, the property is currently used for farming, so it's kind of a green field and coming in um, that way. Uh, on, and, and similar is happening uh, in the rezoning. And so now what will happen is that the, uh, the land use and the zoning need to match, and it would go from the B1 district to the neighborhood mixed use district. Um, and so uh, to make those things consistent so that the applicant can put together a site plan and do a development there, these things will match if we approve those. So the applicant's here uh, to give a presentation. I'll defer to him. Thank you. Please give us your name and address for the record and have at it. Please. <laughs> Burger Singerman. Our offices are at 1450 Brickell Avenue, and I'm prepared to make a brief presentation today. Thank you. So I think for, except for the vice mayor with whom I had no luck reaching, I think I've spoken to all of you uh, individually, which you all obviously stated for the record. Um, as uh, Mr. Cordino mentioned, this application lies just south of Harris Field. And this brief presentation that we are putting on the, um, on the board tonight, uh, mind you, uh, my colleague, Evo Fernandez with Modus Architects, uh, who prepared this, thank you, um, is joining us virtually in case that there are any questions after my presentation. But um, the front portion, the, the, the portion that fronts US-1 on this property and the proposed plan, and, and I want to state for the record, I've told you all individually as well, that you're going to have several cracks at this. First of all, this is first reading. You're obviously going to see second reading, and then there's going to be a site plan component where you will have a, lot, a much more detailed plan. This is a conceptual plan that allows us to start introducing the concept, which has been very well thought out. Um, the, the commercial component fronts US-1 with three buildings, uh, two of which define and front the street uh, that they front on with uh, parking on their backside, uh, which is obviously a, a very popular concept that uh, as opposed to the traditional sea of parking that you would otherwise see from the transit corridor, here you have 
that defining uh, element along US-1. There's a proposed 45,000 square feet of retail in the commercial component. There's a, there are two driveways that lead you back to the residential component, which is comprised of 160 rental apartments that will be dispersed amongst five three-story buildings that will uh, basically uh, surround a lake, which will be there for not only for the mitigation that's required, but also for the benefit and enjoyment by the residents of the residential uh, component. This elevation gives you a little bit of a bird's eye perspective of the buildings looking from US-1 back towards the rear of the property, which as you all know, is uh, surrounded by the trailer parks on each side and Harris Field uh, to our north. As you can see, once again, there's a beautiful uh, green space centering everything that uh, is the basis of our drive in and out to the residential component through the commercial component. And uh, the architect has done an incredible job of uh, providing uh, details and elevations that once again will be fine-tuned when this comes back uh, for site plan approval. But these are elements um, that are very consistent with Homestead. I believe the next uh, neighborhood mixed use uh, land use designation recognizes the need for neighborhood commercial located in proximity to and in conjunction with the residential areas, as well as the neighborhood mixed use zoning, encouraging mixed use developments as a transition between residential neighborhoods and major roadways, obviously US-1 being that roadway and the residential uh, behind it. The only, the other remaining uh, two slides are just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective uh, on size and feel and some of the open areas that are being provided. Uh, we're excited about this development. We think uh, Modus Architects has done an incredible job. Um, uh, we think, uh, we, we hope Homestead will welcome this as uh, staff is recommending your approval. And with that, I'll close and respectfully be here for any questions that you may have. Thank you, appreciate that. All right. Are there any questions or comments from council on this application? Council Wong? I wanted to drive by this property to kind of get a feel for where it was on US-1. I didn't get a chance to do so today, but I will um, later this evening. Do you all know if this was, is this is near JD Red Park? Is it like across the street, near in proximity to it? This is the open field directly south and adjacent to Harris Field, kind of catty cornered across US-1 from our city hall, former city hall site. Got it, okay. Been used in the past as parking, overflow parking for the rodeo event. Got it, okay. Thank you. And to the south lies the uh, trailer park that kind of uh, fronts the, the sport car wash. I kind of put that in perspective. Got it. Yeah, it's, it's north of J.D. Red Park. It's kind of in between. So north yep. north of J.D. Red Park. Yes. On the opposite side. Yes. Right. So and the reason why my attention is calling to that is because I do know that in that area, there's kind of like a gap of resources for commercial and retail. And um, yeah, aside from having to drive across Campbell Drive to go to the shopping center and get through that intersection, uh, there's really nothing in that general vicinity. So I, I mean... I like to see that we're getting some retail and I like the concept of the drawing. Um, and we've been talking about incorporating mixed use residential into the plans as well. Um, but am, am I seeing that PNZ um, recommended denial? Is that what I see on this? Okay. But staff is recommending approval? Okay. And if I could just for the record, Councilwoman, when we did, uh, at the time that we went to PNZ, Unfortunately, this type of a courtesy presentation in anticipation of a site plan approval, and we explained it, you will have an opportunity, but I think it hurt the applicant before that particular board not to have the, uh, a visual to show in advance, and unfortunately, we've been able to do that with this council. We're still hopeful you will support it uh, based on staff support and some of the conversations we've had. Thank you. That was uh, some of the questions I had for now. Thank you. Councilor? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is, this is one where, and I, I spoke with the applicant on the phone, I mean, I'm, I've been on kind of waffling around because I, I think there is a need for, say, market rate apartments here in, in Homestead, uh, a nice market rate apartment concept. Um, 
you know, I, I think I've told the story before. I mean, 12, 14 years ago or so when I was going through law school, I was trying to find an apartment or someplace to actually rent here in the city and there wasn't anything. So you had to go find, you know, either uh, a condo or someplace like that, or you had to rent, you know, a little small bedroom outside in the, in the Redlands somewhere. And so here we are 14 years later, 15 years later, and there still isn't a product in our city that people can come and do that. So I, I do agree that there's a need for the type of product. However, my, my concern is similar to the concern I expressed during the last meeting we had on the city hall property, which is, you know, a competition of a live, work, play with our downtown. And so this, again, somewhat competes with that uh, or could compete with that where you're recruiting some of the same clientele from a commercial standpoint that you would want to be recruiting to our downtown. And so you have this competition, which could take away from what we, we already have planned. And then even if that, you know, so then also in addition to that, if we try to do something with our city hall property um, and ultimately we go forward with one of the plans that's currently being presented, does this type of a product then take away from the value of that product? Do we end up, you know, decreasing the value of our own land or our own product that we're trying to put in there? And again, even though I'm not, I'm not a fan of the product they're trying to propose for that site, if the majority goes that route at some point in the future. So those are, those are kind of the considering factors where I'm, I've got pros and cons, for and against, and so I, I'm curious what my colleagues have to say. I want to hear kind of some of the feedback uh, that you guys have, um, you know, as I'm trying to make my final decision on which way I'm going to go. But, you know, like I said, there's a positive in the apartments. But I did have a question for staff. Um, if, if, the, if this is approved, you know, in the rezoning side of things, what could they put there? Because let's say I like the idea of apartments, but then they go through this process and decide at the backside to turn it into townhomes or just regular housing. Is that possible under the, under the mixed use and what would that look like? Yeah, you know, they, they can put a whole host of uses on this site, uh, retail uses on the ground floor, offices on any floor, uh, re the residential uses would be on the first and second floor. It allows for mixing residential and commercial uses on the same site. Um, it, it then it lists a whole bunch of residential dwelling, uh, lists a whole bunch of, uh, of um, different um, commercial uses as it relates to residential. Um, so, so as, as, it, as it relates to commercial, but the question you have is, is could they put a single family home on there? Is that, they cannot put a single, you cannot put a single family home. You're relatively stuck to, um, I think the town home uh, category, the apartment category. And, the, and you can put that. Okay, and so, so that would be one of my concerns is that, you know, one of the pluses for me would be providing a, a product that we don't currently have in our city, but there's nothing that guarantees that that's the type of product that'll go there. So at the end of the day, these could turn into, you know, 100 and whatever, 60 plus additional units, which I'm, I'm not a big fan of at all. So that, that would obviously push me against it. And then the other question I have is you've got the eight versus the 10. So it looks like under our normal multifamily, they'd be limited to eight units per acre, but under this particular M MMU, it's up to 10 units per acre. So it actually provides for more density that would normally be provided under the multifamily. Um, so again, if this doesn't stay as apartments and goes to something else, you know, that would actually allow for more density that would normally be allowed. So again, other concerns that I, I have kind of as it sits right now. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Shelley. Why, um, Joe, why can't we make the zoning change specific to this presentation that we're seeing, to this rendering? We, we haven't really looked at, the, they haven't presented a site plan for us yet. They've only presented the, the uh, land use change and the zoning change. And when you make the land use changes and the zoning change, you, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot, forgot. Thank you. So, I'm sorry, I'm so comfortable with the mask now that I forgot I had it on. Um, they, they, we're, we're changing the land use and zoning categories. When we change those categories, we open ourselves to, up to whatever is in those categories. And even though the applicant has a concept for what they want to develop in the long run, that would come to us as part of the site plan. So we haven't looked at this really outside of the pictures that they've given us about a week ago, and we haven't analyzed it for site plan. All that would be done later. So you do open yourself up to whatever is allowed in the zoning category and the site plan, as the, as the council member said, this is up to 10 units an acre. It can be 70 feet tall. It can be, and it's got to be a mix of no more than 30% uh, commercial, 70% residential. So you're kind of playing within those bounds. And then the applicant has the flexibility. And we would have no problem 
proffering, because zoning cannot be conditioned, we would have no problem proffering a covenant that in narrative form describes what you're seeing so that when it does come back, you're getting um, this product, which obviously my client has invested lots of money into. He would not be showing something like this. This is a, a very, very uh, uh, credible developer who's built a lot in South Florida, a lot of in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, this is what he wants to do. We'd be happy between first and reading to proffer a covenant with an opinion of title to, to assure the, the council of, of our intentions. Uh, we think, um, we, we don't, we hope you will agree with us that a B1 zoning that this property currently has, has is not in the best interest of the city of Homestead. Going all the way back to the rear of that property with commercial, um, we don't think, and we think the neighborhood mixed use gives the best flexibility for proffering something that allows you to transition between a highway like US-1 and the residential behind it. We think this is the perfect concept, and we're happy to put, you know, uh, our money where our mouth is as it relates to proffering something between first and second reading. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I guess, you know, for the attorneys and our development services director, I think some of those items would include market rate apartments. Um, certainly you've, you've represented not to exceed three stories, which is less than the, the 70. So that kind of height limitation that it's market rate apartments and, you know, to to lock you into that concept, you know, the, the setback of the residential by however many feet your conceptual plan now sets that back from the highway so that, you know, for my taste, those units, residential living units, are not on the edge of the highway. That right. There's clearly a, a commercial, commercial type buffer uh, between the, the street frontages and, uh, and these units. Uh, Council, any, any other thoughts on what might need to be in those covenants to, to kind of ensure that, um, you know, this, this concept plan that's in front of us doesn't, doesn't necessarily deviate at site plan by virtue of, of the rezoning that's, that's asked tonight? I mean, in my, in my 30 plus years of land use I've, and zoning, I, I've never seen any client, much less these guys, you know, do a bait and switch where they show you something and then just to get the rezoning and then come back to something else. I can only speak from my experience. We have. Clients. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure, but I think my prof, my offer to proffer a covenant will back up what I'm saying. So I guess, Mr. Pearl, any motion for approval needs to be conditioned upon uh, the acceptance of a proffered covenant at the second reading? Is that? Well, he's going to be bringing the proffer. You'll have another crack at this at second reading. So. We can pass it as it is tonight, and in the interim, he'll work out whatever he wants to proffer and present that to you for second reading. Right. At second, there would, there would be, obviously, with the acceptance of the proper covenant, tonight we'd just be passing it to go to the next phase. Very good. Thank you. I can add one thing Yes, there. Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you. I just wanted to share that I really like the concept. I can see it there. Um, but one more thing to take into consideration is the type of businesses that we have at Homestead Station. Um, I'm sure it's in your client's best interest as well not to want to compete. Um, so to please keep that in mind as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just add, maybe your architects should contact all of those who've proposed to develop our city hall site. Um, I like this. It's, it's in scope and scale and, and appropriate to our, our community. Thank you. I, Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that, and I've, you know, in our, in our meeting, I, I commended you on, on, on stepping that up a little well, bit you. and doing something that, uh, I, seems to me, for my taste, would uh, stand the test of time. I have one more question for you, sure. just so we, and I'm going to ask all the land use applicants the same question tonight. Can you give me a ballpark figure as to? the amount you've had to pay to the city as cost recovery deposits to get to this point. Mayor, I'd love to give you an answer right now, but I haven't the slightest idea. It's a considerable amount of money. Uh, I don't have that accounting. Um, I'm seeing Michelle shake her head that that Cordino group does not have it, that here. I don't know if Alessandra or anybody, anybody from staff is here to help us with that question. But we have notes in our package as to what's left in your account, but we don't know what you started with and 
you know, for bigger picture discussions on code overhauls and how I we can make things the more, of your question more doable. Help. And well, you know, not not relevant for my vote tonight. Yeah. Just a a side issue curiosity for me. Okay. So is. Uh, there are no further questions from council at this point. I'd ask, is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this matter? Okay, we'll close the public hearing then. So, Mr. White, we need to have a motion on tab 20, 28 first, which is the uh, land, land use, use amendment. amendment. All right. So if we're prepared, do we have a motion for approval on tab 28 for the uh, land use amendment? Councilwoman? can't hear her. Can you hear me now? Okay. Councilman Shelley, does that covenant um, make you feel better? Yeah, the, the conditions that the mayor had stated as far as the market rate, the three-story limitation, representation of what the uh, conceptual plan is that's submitted along with this rezoning and the commercial being on the highway versus the residential component uh, if that would be proffered um, you know would, would be acceptable and when and James when is that time period obviously he's gonna submit more of a formal proffer between first and second reading but for purposes of our vote tonight um, it's just the understanding that that will be coming obviously we have the second reading coming so nothing goes forward between now and then anyways Correct. So in between now and second reading, Mr. Lesquez will submit to us, to staff, we'll review it. It'll make it into the packet for second reading. And on second reading, you'll have an opportunity to review it in the context of both the applications. And um, if you all so choose to approve it, it would be subject to the proffered declaration by the applicant. So yes, but based on that strategy, yes, it would be fine with me. What we're talking about uh, to staff. Um, one of the things that I contemplated eventually having to submit as well is a unity of title for the two parcels. Would we need to do that now, or is that something separate with site plan approval? We, we can deal with that at site plan approval. Okay. That's just a technical question. I wanted to take advantage of what we're here to ask. All right. With that said, I will make the motion to approve. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the uh, land use designation described under tab 28. Do we have a second? We have a second. Can I second by Councilman Roth? Any further discussion? Roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Mayor Lozno? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. So now back to tab seven, Mr. White? Correct, ma'am first reading of the rezoning and I'll just incorporate my comments for the record uh, right. Javi Vasquez 1450 Brickell Avenue sure. all right have you read the title yes. Did, all, right. Okay. all right so um, I guess we yeah, just to make sure is there anyone online or in the audience who wishes to speak on this matter nope and appearing then I'll entertain a motion to approve Car number 3282, the rezoning from B1 to NMU District. This is tab seven. Motion to approve. Move it. Moved by Councilwoman Avila. Second by Councilman Roth. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Mayor Lawsner? Yes. The motion carries. Before thank I you. leave, I want to say thank you to staff, uh, especially the Cordino group, and uh, that helped us move this thing along. And thank you for your confidence tonight. Have a good night. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. White, tab eight. Yes, moving on, Mayor. So the next seven items on your agenda, tabs eight through 14, pertain to uh, Homestead Pavilion acquisitions. Uh, related to the proposed development of a new target. Um, so I can introduce all of those seven items, read them into the record, have a collective discussion, public hearing, and then we can vote on those in the order that they are listed sequentially in the packet. So just bear with me for a moment while I read through <laughs> all of this. 
So tab eight is a resolution of the city of Homestead, Florida, granting a variance request from section 23-87, freestanding and monument signs, city code of ordinances, permit a maximum overall sign area consisting of approximately 196 square feet with a maximum height of 30 feet, where the city code provides for a maximum overall sign area of 80 square feet and a maximum height of 12 feet, providing for increased signage available for the existing Homestead Pavilion Commercial Retail Shopping Center, generally located north of night Northeast 9th Court, east of Southwest 152nd Avenue, south of Southwest 308th Street, and west of 152nd Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 9 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a variance request from Section 23-87, freestanding or monument signs of the City Code of Ordinances, to permit a maximum overall sign area consistent of approximately 165 square feet, a maximum height of 16.5 feet, where the city code provides for a maximum overall sign area of 80 square feet, maximum height of 12 feet to increase signage available for the proposed 72,345 square foot commercial retail, pharmacy, grocery, and liquor store, generally located north of 9th, 9th East, North Port, east of Southwest 152nd, south of Southwest 308th, west of 152nd, is legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 10 is a resolution of the city of Homestead, Florida, approving a special exception Request by Homestead Pavilion Acquisitions LLC to permit a commercial retail use greater than 20,000 square feet for the development of an approximately 72,345 square foot commercial retail pharmacy, grocery store, package liquor store facility on an approximately 4.99 acre parcel of land. Generally located north of Northeast 9th Court, east of Southwest 152nd Avenue, south of Southwest 308th and west of 152nd Avenue as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 11 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida granting site plan approval for an approximately, uh, sorry, requested by Homestead Pavilion Acquisition LLC for the development of a 72,345 square foot commercial retail pharmacy, grocery, and packaged liquor store on an approximately 4.99 acre parcel of land, uh, generally located north of 9th, 9th Northeast 9th Court, east of Southwest 152nd Avenue, south of 308 Street, west of 152nd Avenue, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 12 is the cor corresponding resolution uh, for tentative plat requested by Homestead Pavilion for, de for the development of an approximately 4.99 acre parcel and an approximately 0.98 acre out parcel consisting of commercial retail, pharmacy, grocery, and packaged liquor store. Uh, within the Homestead Pavilion Shopping Center as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 13 is a final order uh, of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a certificate of use requested by Homestead Pavilion Acquisitions, LLC, to permit the sale of beer and wine for off-premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a commercial retail, pharmacy, and grocery store generally located within the Homestead Pavilion Shopping Center as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. And finally, tab 14 is a final order of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a certificate of use requested by Homestead Pavilion Acquisitions to permit the sale of beer, wine, and spirits for the off-premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a package store associated with a commercial retail pharmacy and grocery store located within the Homestead Pavilion Shopping Center, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Thank you. <laughs> Is the applicant's representative here? Good evening, everyone. Graham Penn, Burke Howard, El Fernandez, Lark, and Tappanis, 200, 200 South Biscayne Boulevard. I didn't know if you wanted to hear from staff before I got up here, but I'm ready to do one of three things. We can hear staff. I can give you the full presentation or we can defer a presentation uh, for any questions you may have. We've got a whole slide deck just briefly. Uh, again, our entire team is here. I'll introduce them. Uh, we have Alan Eskenazi, who's the property owner, Todd Hendricks and Sandra Gorman, our engineers, and my colleague, Nick Rodriguez. Um, as you know, this application will be bringing a target store to the city for the first time uh, to join the premier shopping center uh, the Homestead Pavilion located at Campbell and the Turnpike. Um, we are very excited to bring it. Um, if it's directly- let, let me interrupt you a second. I jumped ahead of myself and let's let's stay in order and hear from Mr. Corradino. Okay, sure. 
you can pick up where you left I off. I just that kept blathering my, on, Mr. My, Mayor. I apologize. My error. Mr. Cordino. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be pretty quick with this one, even though it's complicated. We're recommending a, uh, that the mayor and council approve this development. And like like J the attorney had said, there's seven different items with this development. It's relatively complex, but it's, n it's really not that complicated. It's a target store on about five acres east of the pavilion and between the hotel. It's got two variances for signs. Um, you know, when we look at variances, it's got seven variance criteria, hardship criteria. In this case, they meet the criteria, all seven of them, for both of the variances. The property's big, it's odd-shaped, and the signs would be set back very far from the front of the property line. And so uh, we, we've given them the variances for the monument signs, um, which they can put there. It's got a special exception, which is formed for our code. Any building over 20,000 square feet needs a special exception because it's over 20,000 square feet, and that got put into the code a while back, so we run them through the special exception. It's got um, two certificates of use for alcohol. You may, why, why does it have two? Well, it's a big facility. It's got a grocery store associated with it. That's the beer and wine component for a certificate of use, and then it's got a packaged goods store. So we've, it's got two certificate of use. We've run that through. It's got a site plan. And the site plan, uh, we run it through uh, our section, uh, chapter 30, our site planning standards, 171 parking spaces, all the required street trees. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful development from the, that respect. It meets all the requirements of the site plan. It'll fit quite well. And then the, uh, then the, uh, the ministerial act that we have in all these developments is a T-plat. So we've reviewed the, all this stuff through the code. We've looked at all the, the crazy um, criteria and special exceptions and variances that all conforms to everything. They meet the hardships. They've met the special exception criteria. It's a nice site plan. It conforms to the code, and we're recommending approval. And I'll defer to Graham. Thank you, Mr. Cordino. Now. <laughs> I could not have said that more eloquently and quickly than Mr. Cordino. I would have done that in about 20 minutes. So, again, I've got my clicker. If you're interested in me going through it, I can. If you uh, want me just to Defer to questions. We have no objections to any staff's conditions in the resolutions. At, at least for first reading, well, let's go is, through it. Okay. Because Absolutely. let there be no mistake, Homestead, we're getting a target. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> show All right, us so what's we can, coming. We can dwell on it a little bit, Mr. Mayor. Um, here's our existing property. I'm going to put my glasses on. Oh, let's not help. Uh, so as you can see, the uh, existing site located uh, Campbell and the, and the Heft, Kingman Road, which was relocated when the, when the project got originally built. There's our target site between the existing uh, development and the Hilton Inn that you approved a couple years ago. One of the signs, as Mr. Corradino talked about, is we have a detached sign that exists right located next to, uh, at the southwest corner um, by the, um, the former Red Lobster, Red Lobster to go away. Um, the target site is tucked up a quarter mile away from the closest intersection of Kingman and Campbell and a, and a third from, from the avenue. Um, so it's really far away and that is, as Joe indicated, that's why staff is supportive of our signage request. This is a close up view. You can see um, the hotel on the, on the right, Mainline Center on the left. The proposal is, and our plat shows, the five-acre target with that one-acre out parcel to come back to you for site plan approval separately. A um, little bit of history, 2006, the original approval of the center, on just under 400,000 square feet of development on 37 acres. This property was shown as reserved for future development, the phase two of the project. Two hallmark elements that I talk about whenever we talk about Homestead Pavilion is that this project has been designed from the beginning and this, this addition will continue it to have a very nice uh, buffer on the north buffering us from our residential neighbors. It's been well thought out in the past and it's well thought out with this version. I'll show you that in detail. And this developer, as we talk about proportionate share these days, the, the, former, the former owner, developer of the project, spent $5 million in Campbell uh, improvements those improvements went all the way from 152nd on the east to 162nd on the west. So that was their full, full freight of that five million bucks at the time they got approved. We have a significant number of surplus parking spaces. The project assumes uh, a cross parking agreement for the target 
uh, and Meow Parcel to utilize the spaces. Everyone's going to share spaces just like they do now. Uh, these are the lists that uh, James read out so adeptly and quickly of all of our various requests. Again, it looks like there's a lot going on, but it really isn't. It's just very simple when it comes down to it. Oop, I don't know how that got turned, but we can forget that slide. So this is the view of the, of the building looking to the northeast. A very clean architecture, very simple. Uh, and the good part, and the good part about this, when we talk about this building, you look at the kind of the main part of the building that doesn't have the red on it. That's only 22 feet high, so it's not a tall structure. It's a very simple, uh, elegant building. Here's a look to the northwest. That in front of us, where that where the Prius is uh, coming through, that's the entrance that will have the independent liquor sales in it. So it's going to be segregated for the rest of the store but the store will have all the typical Target departments. It'll have normal Target retail, it'll have grocery, it'll have the, the, the CVS pharmacy in it, it'll have the Starbucks, and again, the independent liquor uh, area. Economic benefits, uh, we're looking at almost, we're around 130 total employees for the building. It's gonna cost $20 million to build it, and one and a half million dollars a year in, in sales taxes. This is the colored elevation. Uh, most important one's the, the one on the bottom, which is our northern elevation to our residential neighbors. Again, you can see the, the ghosted out trees there that will show you, I'll show you a little bit more detail, the buffer, the very thick buffer we're putting in there. Important element, 22 feet high there, and there are no doors. There's no access on the north. No people making noise, no loading on the north. It's all very well protected. Uh, this is the close-up view of our landscape plan on the way top. You can see our, our two rows of trees, our Cluja hedge. So we're sticking almost 30 trees behind the building, plus a continuous Cluja hedge. Everyone knows how nice and thick Cluja gets. At the same time, we're inserting 78 extra trees, and, and, and Mr. Corradino alluded to this, 78 uh, uh, trees are going into the existing northern buffer because of the city's uh, lot tree requirement. So that's, again, adding to the quality of that existing buffer. Oh, all my slides are all messed up on this screen. I apologize. All my arrows got messed up. Useless, but, you can, but I can tell you verbally that the, because of the design of Homestead Pavilion, we have the ability, it's already been designed to have uh, truck traffic come through and without interfering with the neighborhood. Proportionate share. We're going to be coming back to you hopefully next month with the actual proportionate share agreement. That's in the resolution. It's about $190,000 uh, to pay for an improvement at 162nd and Campbell. That um, You'll see that in other applications. That's a new issue that's come up and we're one of the first through the shoot. Uh, all right, signs. Let's talk about it briefly. Again, here's our existing sign. On the right is the existing condition. That was what was approved in 2006. In order to provide identification for target, which of course that's an incredibly important, let me go back. Oh, it only goes in one direction. Uh, I gotta get the other one. Uh, this is an incredibly important corner for them. This is the most visibility you get directly from the street of what's in the center. So it's very important that we have a target identification there. They'll be on the left side. You can see we're basically just extending the existing sign up. Let's just put target on the top. We have a little bit more room for a couple of tenants there. So it's the exact same footprint, just slightly taller. Second sign, this is the sign that will be on the target property itself, which identifying the target and the out parcel. This council approved a similar sign located within the main center, basically on the le left-hand side of that uh, photograph back in 2006, recognizing that this property is so oddly shaped, as Mr. Corradino noted, so far away from the intersections, that some sign relief is justified. And we believe it's justified. Again, again, your staff has, re has done thus the favor, which it rarely does, of recommending in favor of a variant. So we appreciate their support. And again, this just hammers it home the rationale for it. We are a quarter mile at our closest point from our closest intersection. So it's a very unusually shaped, you know, not counting Kingman, but from Campbell, a quarter of a mile. And that's as fast as I've gone through this. So uh, I'm not gonna pat myself on the back, but I, any questions you may have, again, our entire team is here. Um, we're very excited to bring the first uh, target south of Cutler Ridge. 
um, to Miami-Dade County, and of course, the city. So we're here for any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate your presentation. Council? Council Baldwin? Thank you. Uh, I love my uh, mom and pop uh, shops and crafty community, but I think I, including myself, a lot of people will be happy with this target. So thank you very much for answering my questions during our conversation. Um, and I look for, is there, there's going to be a site plan approval or this is, it will, it'll be coming back? All right, great. So I, I'm no, in this, favor. this is the site plan. Approval. This is the site, I apologize. So um, I did review it. We did go through it at length and I motion to approve it. Thank you. All right, we have a motion to approve. Let's go ahead and get a second on the table and then we'll finish our comments. Second by Councilman Roth. So, with a motion and second on the table, do we have any further questions or comments from Council? Mr. Councilman Roth. Thank you, Mayor. Just, just a comment. Sometimes that we have to uh, go through the exercise of variances and special exceptions and odd things that um, some people would say that um, we're, we're, we're taking advantage of some of these things. But the way the code is written, we have to do some of these things in order to bring the products that we want to the city. So I just want to point the, that out, that variances are not always bad. Special exceptions aren't always bad. Um, and amending some of our codes is not always bad when it's bringing quality uh, products to the city. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Shelley. Just a quick comment, just to, again, uh, I'm, I think I'm happy like everybody is to see the target make it here. Uh, I think I'd shared with the developers or, or the, the applicants that during my, my meetings with them that I was on P&Z when the, um, this product originally was formed, the Homestead Pavilion, and it originally was supposed to have a target in it, but ultimately because of concurrency and some roadway improvements and some other things that went on, ultimately target didn't make it in there. Um, so it's good to see that finally we're getting the target into that shopping center. I think that's going to be a great addition to our community. I know it's something that people have asked about, I think, ever since I've been elected. You know, what happened to the target? When are we going to get one? Um, so it's glad to see that it's here now. So I just thank you guys for coming through and I think I'm excited to see it come, come to fruition. Thank you, Councilman. All right, so is there anyone online or in the audience wishing to speak on tab eight? None appearing then, we have a motion and a second for approval. So I'll ask for a roll call vote on tab eight. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right. Do we need a motion for approval on car number 3251, tab 9? The variance for the monument sign. Moved by Councilman Roth. Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Bailey. Anyone? Uh, in the audience or online, we'll close the public hearing then. If there's nothing further, we'll have a roll call vote on tab nine. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Roth? Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Mayor Lawson? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next item, car number 3247, tab 10. Need a motion for approval. A resolution approving the retail use greater than 20,000 square feet. We have a motion for approval. We have a motion by Councilwoman uh, Avila, seconded by Councilman Roth. Is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this matter? We'll close the public hearing and ask for a roll call vote on tab 10. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Rawl? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next item, car number 3245, tab 11, resolution, um, the approval of the uh, retail pharmacy and packaged liquor store within the target project. We have a motion for approval. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. Seconded by Councilman Roth. Anyone online or in the audience wishing to speak? None appearing, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a roll call vote on tab 11. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. 
Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next item is tab 12, car number 3246, uh, granting tentative, tentative plat approval for this project. We have a motion for approval. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. Second. Second by Councilwoman Avila. Anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this matter? Mayor, Councilman Roth? <laughs> Just, just one question. Just the anticipated date that you plan on opening the uh, store. They are ve very eager to move forward. My understanding is October 22. That's correct. Yeah, October 22. So just about a, a little bit over a year. So very, very good. That's a that's work. a commendably aggressive target. Pardon the pun. Trust me. <laughs> the, uh, Alan's looking at me. Yes, he knows how aggressive they've been. So we're right. very excited. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Is that it? All right. So we'll close the public hearing, and we are on uh, what, tab 12. We have a motion and a second for approval on tab 12. A uh, roll call vote. Councilman Shelley. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilwoman Avila. Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item is tab 13, car number 3249, granting a certificate of use for Homestead Pavilion acquisitions for the sale of beer and wine for off-premises consumption. We have a motion for approval. We have moved by Councilwoman Bailey. Seconded by Councilman Roth. Is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this matter? Not appearing, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a roll call vote on tab 13. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Mayor Lawson? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right. Next item, car number 3250, tab 14, uh, granting, we're doing 14, did we just do 14? Or we need to do 14? Or, yeah, we're on 14, okay. Tab 14, the, uh, to permit the sale of beer and wine for off premises uh, consumption. We have a motion for approval. Moved by Councilman Roth. Seconded by Councilwoman Bailey. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this matter? Close public hearing and ask for a roll call vote on tab 14. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Councilman Roth? Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Mayor Lawson? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. I believe that concludes the land use items for tonight and takes us to. One, one last land use item, Mayor, under legislative matters, to tab 29. Skip to tab 29, then. Can I read it, Mr. White? Yes, this is the first reading of an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the City of Homestead comprehensive plan to add a property rights element as required by and in conformity with section 163, 3177, Subsection 6, Florida Statutes 2021, providing for adoption and transmittal of this comprehensive plan amendment pursuant to Section 163, 3184, Florida Statutes, providing for inclusion in the City of Homestead Comprehensive Plan, providing for renumbering, providing for severability, providing for conflicts, and providing for an effective date. This is first reading. I've been asked to uh, give you a little overview of this, Mayor, Council Members. So this is brand new legislation that came out of Tallahassee this legislative session. Um, it's a proposed bill um, in, in some similar form that had been floating around Tallahassee for a number of years. Um, and it finally made it through um, this year and sent to the governor who signed it and became effective July 1st. And essentially what it does is it requires or mandates that each local government add a new element to their comprehensive plan um, with regards to this property rights element. 
and the statute specifically details language at a minimum that the local government must have in their comprehensive plan. And so the proposed ordinance that you have before you does exactly that. It just takes the language from the statute, regurgitates it in almost exact format, and uh, specific to us, and uh, creates a new property rights element. So just brief summary, every, every local government throughout the state has to have a comprehensive plan. Um, in that comprehensive plan, uh, there are various um, requirements or elements that you have to have. You, we're most familiar with dealing with the future land use element like we had tonight, because it's the, the future land use map, and that's the most we talk about. But in the comp plan, there's a transportation element, there's a, um, an interlocal government coordination element, there's a capital improvement element. Um, there, it, it, there's roughly approximately 10 elements. So this would be the next element that we would create. Um, and uh, moving forward in the future, just like every development order uh, that we issue, we always have to make a finding that it's consistent with the comprehensive plan. So this would just be rolled into our regular review, how we always uh, look at and analyze uh, developments for consistency with the comp plan. And essentially what it does is it just already memorializes private property rights that are recognized under state and federal law in case law already. And so you may ask, well, why do we need this? And that's what the Florida League of Cities and a whole bunch of other uh, the League of Counties were, were, were all sort of asking the legislators, well, this is sort of redundant. We already have protections under federal law, under state law, why is this needed? And the best that I can, can give you is that this was a, a private interests sort of uh, driven legislative change uh, with very few carve outs um, for anybody. And um, the sensitivity of this is that we are required to do this, get this through before we can do any future amendments to our comprehensive plan. So that's why you're seeing this now. Um, after, if you all approve it this evening, it'll get sent to Tallahassee, it'll get reviewed, We'll get comments back, we'll have second reading, and then we'll send it back to Tallahassee, and once we get their final blessing, then we'll be able to move forward with other comprehensive plan amendments. Now, they did provide, they were back and forth for a little while on whether or not comp plan amendments that were already in the pipeline would be considered or deemed uh, they would allow to move forward, and they we finally got direction that they would allow things that were already in the pipeline or already um, applications were already made that we could process those. But anything new we wouldn't be able to do until this is adopted. So I'm happy to answer any further questions or go into detail further if you'd like. Right. Thank you, Mr. White, but I think I heard, and I think the real takeaway is, is this, this does not further tie our hands in any manner case law and, and statutes, for the most part, already covered what we now have to codify in our, our land use plan. Correct. We're really not, not giving anything up or gaining anything. All right, so do we have any questions or comments from Council? Council Wallen? It might seem redundant, but I like the um, reminder to what's the goal here consider rights of property owners and local decision making so we just have to keep those um, goals in mind as we continue to do the work up here so not that we aren't but it's just a reminder and I guess some municipalities around the state needed that so that's all I want to say thank you absolutely but I bet you the proponents of this new statute were the guys with applications in the pipeline not the neighbors the neighbors weren't the people. That's, but you're right. That's our job. That property rights are a two-way street, existing and and proposed. All right. Is there uh, anyone wishing to speak on this matter? If none, then I'll close the public hearing and um, ask for a motion to approve car number 3311, tab 29. I'll move it. Moved by Councilwoman Avila. To have a second. Second by Councilwoman Bailey. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Shelley. Yes. Councilwoman Avila. 
Yes. Councilman Ron. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Mayor Lawsner. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Okay, the next item I believe is you, Madam Manager, tab 30. Yes, it is, Mr. Mayor, thank you. On November 18th, 2020, the City Council approved the purchase of an Altec Model AT41M bucket truck from Altec Industries for $159,117. This truck will be utilized for the day-to-day -day operations of the Homestead Public Services Electric Division's electric facilities. In June of 2021, the city was notified by Altec that due to industry-wide increases in commodities and manufactured components, Altec would be implementing a 5% surcharge effective on all units shipped after July 1st, 2021, resulting in a $4,780 increase in the price of the truck. Procurement staff has confirmed that the source well contract used for this purchase allows for the surge, surge charge increase. This truck's already in production. Reportedly, the increase is due to a 138% increase in steel costs. And actually, the truck today, if we got it, would cost $173,000. Staff recommends that mayor and council authorize the city manager to approve an amendment to the existing purchase order 210987 issued to Altec Industries, Inc. for an additional $4,780 for a total of $163,897. Thank you. Any questions or comments from council? Just one, Mayor. Thank That's you. One <clears throat> Is it necessary to bring this to us with this little bit of amount? I mean, it's in a contract already that we would be charged this anyways, or you just bring it to us for information purposes? Um, just, just curious. Councilman, due to the fact that the amount exceeds the previously approved amount from council, yes, we have to bring it back to you. Even though there's the, the, the caveat in the contract that says they are allowed to do that? Yes. So it has to come back to us? Yeah. So if it was a dollar more, it would have to come back to us? We'd talk to the vendor about the dollar. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilman. Anything further from council? Anyone wishing to speak on this matter? Well, then I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion for approval. We have a motion for approval. Moved by Councilman Shelley. Second by Councilman Roth. Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilman Shelley. Yes. Councilman Roth. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Mayor Lawsner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Madam Manager, tab, uh, or is this you, Mr. Pearl? Tab 31? Uh, tab 31 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, authorizing the submission of a grant application for federal funds from the U.S. Economic Development Administration Grant Program, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Madam Manager? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're seeking to apply for a $3,500,000 grant from U.S. Economic Development Administration Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation Program grant. This grant would be used for the construction of part of phase one of the Homestead Sports Complex Park renovation, which will include a track with a turf soccer field, a stage, and a restroom building. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the attached resolution authorizing the city manager to, to submit a grant application to the U.S. Economic Development Administration Administration Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation Program for $3.5 million for the Sports Complex Park Renovation Project. This grant requires a $700,000 matching fund, which we are hoping will come from other grants, parks and recreation are applying for. Thank you. Council, questions, comments? Good. We have uh, anyone who wishes to speak on this matter in the audience? Yes, Mayor. There is one online. Okay. Uh, Ramiro Orta. All right, Mr. Orta, you know the drill. Hey, Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, the question that I have, because I did overhear the city manager um, uh, go over a brief description as to what these funds will entertain. Is there any reason why we keep giving AYSO soccer fields? And is there any other plans that to implement other sports to the area? Because all I heard was soccer fields. Uh, 
Madam Manager, did you did you understand the question? I, I don't understand the question because these soccer fields are not necessarily for AYSO, and I think Mr. Orta indicated perhaps they are. Well, and I think well, yeah, they are. They, they are because at the last meeting, AYSO did specify that they were granted permission to extend to the fields as to where the city has planned for. Um, they made it very clear that they've already uh, informed the city that they're going to take over those fields, which are baseball and softball fields. I, I, unless, I don't know of any plan or any suggestion that they would take over those other fields. And right now there's no plan other than the contractual obligation we have with AYSO to use the fields that they're presently using. And the proposed plan that we have for further improvements, obviously we haven't made any arrangements for anybody to use a potential new soccer field. Right. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Just wanted to hear that. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Orta. Anybody, anyone, anything further? Um, nobody else but Mr. Orta, if you can please lower your hand. All right, we'll close the public hearing and I'll ask for a motion to approve this matter. Move it. Moved by Councilwoman Avila, seconded by Councilman Shelley. Roll call. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilman Rawl? Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carried. All right, thank you. Next item, tab 32, corner number 3315. Mr. Pearl. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Tab 32 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, acting to join with the State of Florida and other local governmental units as a part of the Florida Memorandum of Understanding and Formal Agreements implementing a unified plan providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Madam Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The state of Florida has filed an action pending in Pasco County, Florida, and a number of Florida cities and counties have also filed an action in re National Prescription Opiate Litigation, MDL number 2804, ND Ohio, the opioid litigation. And the city of Homestead is a litigating participant in that action. And the state of Florida and lawyers representing certain various local governments involved in the opioid litigation have proposed a unified plan for the allocation and use of prospective settlement dollars from opioid related litigation. And whereas the Florida Memorandum of Understanding, the Florida Plan, sets forth a framework of a unified plan for the proposed allocation and use of opioid settlement proceeds, staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the attached resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a memorandum of understanding with the state of Florida, which sets forth a framework of a unified plan for the proposed allocation and use of opioid settlement proceeds. It is anticipated that the formal agreements implementing the Florida Plan will be entered into at a future date. All right, so this is an agreement to work toward an agreement among the cities and, and parties as plaintiffs. Is that basically? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that's my understanding. It's an agreement to work toward a mutually agreeable agreement. Spoken like a lawyer. Okay. All right, any further questions or comments from council? Anyone wishing to speak on this matter from the public? Close public hearing and ask for a motion for approval of this matter. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Avila. Roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilman Raw. Councilwoman Avila. Councilman Shelley. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Mayor Lozner. Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. All right, Madam Manager, tab 33, discussion on the former YMCA facility's future use. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On November 16th, 2020, the YMCA vacated the city-owned facility at Harris Field. Part of that facility is now leased to Le Jardin Community Center for a period of five years. The other portion of the facility, including the gym, the locker rooms, and the pool, remain vacant. A number of groups have approached staff regarding possible uses for the facility and have inquired about potentially leasing it. And as you may recall, Mayor and Council, some months ago, 
we advised council that staff would look into the cost to potentially improve the locker rooms ourselves and if it wasn't too costly to operate it ourselves. But at this time, we don't have the funds for those improvements. So currently, we are renting just the gym to two groups for volleyball, but we're seeking direction from council with regard to the desired uses for the facility, because what we had contemplated previously and as previously stated, if we couldn't do it, perhaps we'd put out an RFP. Thank you, Madam Manager. Now, is my understanding correct that, that in, other than the volleyball use that's in place now, there have been other inquiries made? Yes, Mayor, there have been. And there's been inquiries to use the entire facility, inquiries to just use perhaps the gymnasium, but yes. And that's part of why we want to ensure that the council gives us some direction so that what the council would like to see there, we incorporate into anything we do going forward. Oh, can, you, can you generally describe what the uses would be by these, these two groups that have made inquiries? It's actually more than two groups. Um, one group wanted to use just a gym, and that was for um, potentially a, a, a recording production for a TV show. And obviously, the group now, the groups now who are using it, a volleyball, volleyball program for girls. And there were a couple of others who wanted to use the entire side of the building, including the pool and do some improvements so that they could use some of the rooms there as well as the gymnasium for a sports-oriented um, uh, school program. That's generally speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, that kind of covers it? Yes. Okay. Council? Councilman Roth? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I, I would say if, if we're not in a position to do it ourselves financially, then... Um, the next best thing is to do an RFP, put it out there, and see what comes in, and we can make a decision based on that. Obviously, I think the um, the bones of the building are good, the pool is good, um, and there's plenty of space for someone to come in there and do something. Um, the gym is beautiful. If you haven't been in our gym, it's with the basketball. You can put many, in many. There's many uses in there. I'm surprised they're using it for volleyball, but I guess it would be. A, it's a good volleyball court too. So um, that would be my my thought process. Put it out for RFP, um, and let's see, you know, what comes back from it. It's not like the city hall property that's going to be, you know, taken down and brought up. This is a structure that's already there and in place and. Uh, we've, we've, I think we've proven to ourselves and to staff and to this, the city that we have value in that building since YMCA left by leasing it to Le Jardin. So um, certainly if somebody's willing to uh, take over that building and operate it in, in the way it was meant to be operated, then I would be all for that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. I agree completely. I would just like to definitely see some very specific things go into that RFP. Um, I know that I'm, I'm not the most uh, experienced with how they go out, but we need to make sure that it would be something that the public is still able to use. Um, not that it goes to a charter school or something else which would not allow our residents to be able to use it. And if for any reason there isn't something that comes back that we all approve, um, there's a lot of potential to slowly fix some of those rooms up. There are so many dance companies that are expanding, a lot of different extracurricular activities that would love to rent it, I'm sure, um, quite a few days a week. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Avila. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so. I my impression with the RFP would be for a more permanent long-term uh, tenant, whereas I believe if we have a proposer that is interested on taking over the current vacant site and working in conjunction with the other tenant that we've approved and maybe offering similar terms, maybe that's something we could consider without an RFP so we can get someone in quickly like we did with Le Jardin. Is that an option? And if not, why? legal option. Thoughts, Madam Manager? Well, actually, um, because we've had a number of different 
proposed uses of this in the interest of fairness, um, we thought that others would be able to potentially say what they wanted to do. Um, there are actually some very good proposed uses of it, and I don't think legally you're precluded from doing what you've done with Les Jardine, and Matt can protect, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I say, just because there weren't more than one party interested in it, it seemed that everybody perhaps should have an opportunity to say how they wanted to use it. That was all. Thank you. Thank you, brother. I'd like to hear more. Matt, um, give some guidance here. <laughs> Charter uh, roadmap for us. Well, I mean, I'm not familiar with the proposals that have been presented to date, um, so I'm not sure whether they're seeking city dollars to put things in different requirements. Depending what's being proposed, there would be different requirements. Are we the ones who are going to be responsible for improvements? And so I think that, you know, in the absence of some context, um, an RFP is a solid idea. You get a collection of things. You'll get to see what the proposals are. If they're open to the public is a criteria. I don't know um, what sort of private use. I, 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 perhaps if the manager wants to enlighten us, me. Um, but I think the RFP is a fair way, as the manager suggested, to bring everyone to the table. I don't know if they received something from somebody who's adjacent to Lady Jardine. If they want to expand, we could, you know, we could speak to that. But I'm not familiar with. And was that one of the proposals? Or? No. And Councilwoman, I'm not sure. Were you thinking that the RFP was going to be for the use of the whole building? Because it wasn't. What we were suggesting was for the immediate use of that other side of the building, not for the whole building. And we would suggest that it would be similar in terms of time terms, as it is to Le Jardine, giving the council the opportunity, as you've spoken of before, to perhaps put an RFP out for the entire facility at some point in the future. Does that kind of clarify what you said? It does, it does clarify it. So the, ter the specific terms that we would be putting in the RFP would match, want to match what we have set up currently with our other tenant. Y yes, potentially, but I think the important part would be that it would match in terms of time because the timeline that the council gave was very specific with respect to Le Jardine, and this would necessarily Five years. be, yes, potentially. And then do we have to do an RFP, or can we do something similar to what we did with the other city hall site? Mr. Pearl? Uh, and again, I think legally you can, but as I suggested, I'm not sure who it would be most fair to do that with since we have a few people interested. That was all. Is that within the CRA? I don't believe it is. No, Mayor, it's not within the CRA, so it would not be a 163 notice. The, what we did with the old city hall site is statutorily required. Um, whenever you're going to dispose of a property interest within the CRA, you're required to publish notice of that you're interested in disposing that property interest, whether it be a lease or, or the underlying fee. You're not bound by that outside of the CRA. That requirement doesn't exist. So we have a little bit more flexibility on the other side of the street. And how long would this, the RFP, Mayor reminded us last time that that would take a very long time. So, I mean, can we create a hybrid where we're still being fair, putting out a notice, but not doing a full RFP so we can get some proposals in and writing quickly? I'm confident, Councilwoman, that we can get an RFP out in September. And if we can get it out in September and it's on the street for, say, Jerry, 30 days? 30 days. 30 days, 30 days that there'll be a quick, pretty quick turnaround. Thank you. I'm satisfied with that. Thank you. I guess from my perspective, if the RFP clearly states that it would be a for a term and a renewal term not to exceed X number of years, then a given proposer will determine whether or not that is financially viable for the investment that needs to be made for whatever they're going to do. And, and it goes from, from there. If certainly, I don't I think we've had this discussion that we really don't want to lock down that facility for a very long time. That we've done that with, with this and others in the past and it's not not worked out well. So I guess with that, do you have enough direction at this point? The, the only thing I would ask, and I, I think the Councilwoman Bailey made it clear that one thing she would want to see in the RFP, that there is a benefit to the public. And 
when we put out the RFP, we, we would have certain criteria and we would say, explain the benefit to the public in addition to what you are proposing there and obviously um, suggest leasing terms and we would want everyone who's interested in it to come to the site and see it to see what it needs and potentially describe not only the use of the gymnasium but could perhaps other groups use the gymnasium in, in conjunction with what you're doing. I guess overall just that it's the best proposal for the benefit of most people. Councilman Shelley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think I think an RFP, you know, would be the best way to do it. Um, just get it from a fairness perspective and see what's out there. I, I did have some of the qu same questions, though. Is although it seems like we've congealed around an RFP as the process, um, what do we want to be in that RFP? What are we looking for? I think you guys need some direction on, you know. And for me, I, I do I do like the idea of it continuing to be a public use building, um, you know, if if at all possible. You know, although I wouldn't. I wouldn't be opposed either to finding a way to maximize whatever type of revenue or, or income that would come into the city um, you know, for a different type of use that maybe wasn't directly related to the public. So there had to be some sort of a scoring system there that might, might have a hybrid that you know, get credit for a public use, but also you know, additional points if it's um, you know, more revenue for the city generation. But, but I do agree. I think that that's always been a public use building. I, I don't see, think you, know, you may or may not be able to get a private use with just half of it, but again, it's still a large building, so there's still a lot that can be done in, in the portion that's not already rented. Um, but that's kind of my, my feeling is, yeah, I'd like to see public use, but I also would like to see what's out there that's a non-public use. What, what type of private use, but they can provide a service or can provide a, a amenity to our city that we don't currently have. I don't have anything off the top of my head per se, uh, but I don't want one to preclude the other. I don't know how you guys would write that or how that would be included, but just something for, for thought. Certainly, I agree. In an ideal world, there would be some public access component, but I agree with Councilman Shelley. We don't want to foreclose something that we may not be able to think of now that would be a fantastic uh, balance between a community amenity and income to the city that, that we might not want to, to lose out on because we're requiring the public access component. Understood. And what we can do is ensure that whoever would respond to it includes what they're proposing for each of the various parts of the building. For example, what are you proposing for the pool? What are you proposing for the gymnasium? And the different rooms that could potentially be used for dance programs or whatever. So we can do that. I, I think the only question I would have is, do you want us to make sure that whoever responds would be wanting to use the entire side of the building, pool, gym, room, or would you want us to entertain, well, I just want to use the gym or I just want to use the pool? Mayor? Yes. Mayor? I was actually just going to suggest that. If we can also give an option because, you know, there's basketball, volleyball, and then there's something more like a ballet studio. This is really built like a community center. So I think it's going to be tough unless you find unless there is a program out there that offers different type of activities. I think we should offer that option. Um, it would be great during this time for startup companies to have an opportunity to start their program and once they're ready, find another location. So keep that in mind too. And if all agree, I would love to see it as a section as well as an option. Well what we can do, because I think there'll be proposals that would suggest a use for the whole building, which would be great, but we can also add something that there's a potential sublet or something to things like that, which I think is probably very doable. Well, and if a proposal for the use of a portion of the building comes in, we would then have to use our best judgment as to whether or not the use and the portion of the building being consumed would in effect preclude or promote the use of, of the balance of the building. But again, I think you've got to provide that option to, to proposers to, to let us know what they have in mind. It's a lot okay. of building there. Understood. Well, Shelley. One other, one other quick question. Again, I probably won't be sitting here when you guys make these decisions, but, but as far as discretion built in, because I think that one of the things I'm hearing is we don't know exactly maybe what we want, we want, to, we want to see what's available and then we can make some decisions. But I know with an RFP process, it's more rigid. You've got scoring, you've got 
you know, certain criteria, you have a committee that reviews it, and then it comes back to us with recommendations, which then somewhat limits our ability as policymakers to pick and choose what we want. Because we may, like some of us may want certain parts of it, you know, there's a proposal for the whole building, but there's some proposals to do uh, pieces of the building together, makes the whole building. With the scoring system, the RFP, does it give us enough flexibility to then make that decision up here, even though the scoring has come back to us saying, well, based on what we put out, this should be the winner? Because that's, that's my only, I guess, question that I would have, is how do we bake something in there that gives us as policymakers the ability to maybe um, pick and choose based on what we see come in? I think one thing that could be done is to address that is that part of the scoring could be a higher scoring for the use of the whole building by one entity and with perhaps corresponding sub uses for others as opposed to, well, I just want to use the gym. So if I just want to use the gym, the part where you get points for the whole thing, I'm not going to get those points. But the only thing, again, because we don't know what's going to be proposed, I guess, and, and again, maybe this is all theoretical and probably probably not necessary to have the conversation about, but I at least wanted to put it out there that I think what I'm hearing, and if I, if I was sitting up here making this decision, because there's so much flexibility between community use and revenue production and everything in between, how do we bake something in there that allows us to, without violating any legal parts of the RFP, to just rearrange it and say, well, we actually like this better, even though it scored lower. And, and that's, I guess, more for a legal procurement question answer before we put the RFP out, maybe you can get some additional guidance for us. But that would be my only other question. Thank you, Councilor Roth. Thank you. Councilman Shelley makes a good point. Because um, the RFP process is, is, is a different process. And I, I don't know if there's any other process to say, hey, we just want to hear your thoughts versus a scoring process and, you know, just what are your thoughts, you know, what would you like to do with this building if you had control over this building? Because you mentioned subleasing, which is a good concept. So somebody may want to come in there and operate a, a swimming pool program where they're teaching, you know, kids uh, safety around water, you know, swimming lessons, things like that, but they don't have the capacity to run the gym, but, you know, maybe they took on the whole project and said, okay, I'm going to sublease out these rooms to dance groups. I'm going to sublease this, the gym out to a basketball league or a volleyball league or whatever, you know, they want to do with that. So is an RFP the right way to go this process, you know, when you're, you're scoring them and saying, okay, we got to take the, the, the best score in the RFP when um, that may not be necessarily the, the options that we want to entertain. And so I think Councilman Shelley brings up a very good point that is RFP the right way or is there another another way we can go about it that's that's still limited to a 30-day time frame and we we get input from potential vendors that want to operate that building instead of doing the RFP it comes back and wow the use is really not what we wanted it to be and now we're stuck with maybe even having to award an RFP to somebody you know uh, I, I don't know but is there another another process we can use yeah. Yes, I, I think we can craft something that provides you with a little bit more flexibility. Um, perhaps we'll solicit letters of interest. Um, we can set the parameters of what we want for the use of the site, but rather than scoring those, then we'll present the, we could present those sort of letters of interest in the use of the site to the council without a, a firm ranking and scoring process. And you can evaluate those and you can direct staff um, based on the responses as to what, if any, avenues you'd like to pursue. And that would be globally advertised, such as an RFP or the, the 163 sure. notice, correct? Yes. Okay. And I that, think that, that's fair. And that, legally, assuming we do that, because obviously we have probably at least five right now who would respond to okay. that letter of interest, my question is, when the council sees that, would they have the legal ability to then um, direct staff to negotiate a lease with the entity that they like the most. Sure. Okay, so that would be very quick and effective. Great. We have That's our direction. Way to go, Council. Councilwoman Alvala. Thank you. That's what I was looking for originally. I appreciate you asking the question better. Um, I guess my only concern is that once the cat is let out the bag and everyone's seeing what everyone else wants to do, how do we protect those proposers from not um, you know, exposing their proposal and then us still going out for an RFP after that? Are we in agreement that we're going to close 
that period of time and only consider the proposals that came in during that period, like we did with the 163. Yeah, I mean, we'll have a due date just like we would with our RFP. Um, those proposals will be moved on to an agenda, at the, at a, the, if not the subsequent, I guess depending on the timing, either the cow or council meeting after we receive them, and then we'll, we'll take direction. Um, if you decide to go, if you're not happy with what comes back and you want to go out, I mean, the cat will be out of the bag at that point. Once it's presented to you, you can't unring that bell. Um, if you're not happy with, comes, with what comes back or you've decided after reviewing those things that it's you know set off a light bulb and now we know this is exactly what we want, then we can always go back for an RFP in the future. Subsequent to that, you're not gonna be bound to do anything on you know these LFIs and to the councilman's warrant. In our RFPs, we always reserve the right not to award anyway. So you're, you won't be bound by this initial process, and if there's something you wanna do subsequently, then we can do that. Oh, that's fine, thank you. Yeah. Oh, one, the, one more. Oh, councilman sorry. Roth. Yeah, no, my thought, your thought? Go I'll go. Um, yeah, just to uh, keep that thought process going, once we narrow it down, I think, to an idea or a thought, then we can get into the, the, the feasibility of each of the um, potential tenants as far as their financial worthiness. So um, I think to help answer that question, it's not gonna be a free-for-all of, oh yeah, I can do this. No, you know, these are the ideas, these are the thought processes. And then once we narrow it down to a specific vendor, then we can go into the, the other part of it where we're looking at the financial aspects, their, their credit worthiness, and are, do they even have the ability to do what they say they're gonna do? So um, that's just another step along the line. But I think the letter of intent is good because it, as Matt said, maybe there's a spark there. So, hey, that's exactly what we were thinking about, that you know, you, thank you for the idea. And then we can go through the, 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 the fiscally responsible portion, portion of what we have to do after that. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you, Mayor and Council, because this is much appreciated because, as I said, we wanted to make sure that we were fair and to Councilwoman Avila's point, not give any facts that aren't really open to the public at this point. So this is great direction. We'll get it done and we'll bring back what kind of letters of interest we get. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. We look forward to it. A lot of good things coming uh, our way. All right, it's now time to open the floor to public comments. Each individual will have three minutes to speak. Please come to the podium. Um, do we have anyone who has signed up to speak previously that's here? No, no pre-registrations. Pre Is there anyone here in the audience wishing to speak before we go to our online participants? Anyone here in the audience wishing to issue any public comment? All right, hearing none, who do we have online? Um, Ramiro Orta. Never heard of him. Uh, Mr. Orta, you're up, three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first and first, uh, um, council members, uh, council member, uh, councilwoman, I would like to thank you for the presentation today. Um, that really encourage many of, of the young athletes in Homestead to continue because, I mean, you don't know what they were saying after they got those awards, but they wouldn't stop smiling. So thank you for that. Um, on that same note, I just want to inform you guys, um, about seven months ago, Homestead didn't have any softball teams. Um, with the help of a couple of organizations within the city of Homestead, some uh, Mr. Roth, uh, um, Mayor Lozner, um, your organizations, along with Councilwoman Avila and Bailey, you you guys helped put the, this league together. All these girls were looking for was for an opportunity, and they got it. Regardless of the budget that we had and the limited resources and, and equipment that we had, these girls played, but they played with a chip on the shoulder. Um, just to let you guys know, because of your efforts, last night these girls won the playoffs and they will be in the championship representing homestead tomorrow at franjo park so i just want to personally thank every single one of y'all for contributing and um and being part of this uh special moment with the youth of homestead and then finally uh 
Mayor Vosner, my sincerest condolences about your father. Um, I'm sorry about that, but um, I hope everything um, is okay with you guys, but you're in my prayers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Orta, and congratulations to the girls. We'll see them back here again. All right. Is there anyone else online? All right. Then we will close the public comments portion of the agenda. Is there any further business from the city manager? No, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Attorney? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to request an executive session in the matter of McDonough v. Sewell in the city of Homestead, case number 3D21-1545 in the 3rd District. Good. Make it happen. All right. Reports of Mayor and Council. Councilman Roth, you're first on the list. Thank you, Mayor. Normally, I don't have much, but uh, something uh, has come up and uh, patches uh, PPEC down in Florida City. Actually, they started here in Homestead uh, back in 2005, and I think some of you have been contacted by them. They have a golf tournament coming up um, that is in October, and they asked if I would reach out to each of you, and I think Michelle is aware of th them contacting them. If you guys could uh, help in any way sponsoring whatever you feel is comfortable uh, for, for that organization, so patches, the golf tournament, sometime in October. Uh, they asked if I wanted to play, and I said, you know, it's kind of early, and it's all the way in Key Biscayne, so I don't think I'm going to be playing, but I did do a, a contribution. So um, the Patches have been helping children in our community, you know, since 2005, and I, I've been a very passionate supporter of that organization. So uh, if you guys could see it in your heart to help them out just a little bit, reach out to Michelle. She's got the information. <clears throat> and I just, uh, normally I don't bring these things up, but I thought I'd bring it up tonight. And everybody, you know, we had a vision, downtown Homestead and uh, revitalization, Homestead Station. Um, and then, you know, we're considering different projects, City Hall, uh, the one we heard tonight, south of the rodeo grounds. And I just would like staff to look at and figure out uh, what, what can we do to help the leasing partners at Homestead Station uh, begin to entertain uh, tenants, uh, possibly adjusting or correcting some of the rental amounts uh, in order to uh, attract tenants to that facility. Um, I know we've had a few uh, that had expressed uh, an interest in wanting to lease in there, and then there were some stipulations and conditions uh, that kind of hindered their abilities to do things in those spaces. So, um, and I'm not sure of all of the different obstacles that they faced over there as far as uh, who does build outs and things like that. Um, uh, I understand COVID hit and it was bad timing, however, uh, we have to move forward, and the longer spaces stay empty in that homestead station, uh, and, you know, we don't have any control over what happens in there, that's kind of detrimental to what we were trying to do. And just look at that, see if you can figure that out. Maybe you come back and tell us or give us a report on what we can or can't do, what communications have been going on with the shopping center. I think it's a shopping center group that, that has the... the the contract, maybe it's with Axiom. I'm not sure of all the details, but it is the shopping center group, and, and we can absolutely come back, and we can come back with a report. I can tell you that we are very concerned about it as well. And one of the things that we've done very recently is our CRA director put together some facts and figures with regard to the economics in Homestead and why it should make that area attractive to tenants who might want to come in. But we'll put something together and we'll bring it back to you and let you know what we're doing. And we can also speak to potential incentives that we would have to help people. Yeah, because, I mean, we've got Seminole Theater. They're back up and running. Losner's Park's going to reopen here in the next six or eight months, I would assume. So... Uh, three, three months. Three months? Three months. No, oh, six okay. to eight. That sounds good. Thanks. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> whatever it is. But I, I just, you know, I'm in this business, and I understand um, you want to try to do the best you can for your, your customers, but it's been a long time. 
and we don't have any activity there. And I think it's time we, you know, we've got all these other people that want to do things in the city. We can't get our building filled up, and I think it's kind of weird that we can't do that. So just look into it. Let us know. And if there's anything we need to do to help, you know, the process, I'm sure we can do something. Thank you, Mayor. We'll That's do. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Councilman Roth. It's interesting. Just in the last 10 days to two weeks, I've been contacted by several local members of the, the real estate community, both attorneys, realtors, you know, across the gamut, asking me those very same questions. And given with what I've had going on the last week or so, uh, I haven't had time to look at it yet, but I do have from staff a copy of our contract with, with the shopping center group so that I can educate myself because I, I too am concerned. Somebody talked about, you know, competing with, with Homestead Station. Well, there's no competition when there's virtually zero there. And, and you're right, it can't remain empty. And I think we need to get proactive just as the last council did and got proactive and, and made that happen. We've got to, to do what we reasonably can to help make it a success in terms of occupancy. Uh, it's very, very timely. Thank you. And, Mayor, if I may, just as a point of clarification, the agreement that we gave you is not an agreement with the shopping center group. The shopping center group has an agreement with the people who run it. All right. Very good. Councilwoman Avila. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as well, condolences, Mayor, to you and your family. And my prayers are sincerely with you all during this difficult time. Uh, I want to touch on development services with all of the applications that have come through and that including those heard tonight and those moving forward uh, being deferred to next week. Um, it, it, it just it, you identify where the pitfalls are and where the where the um, speed bumps are in making business move forward. And I, I would like to know when is our next development services workshop? Is it on the calendar? Not on the calendar yet, no. So it's been probably about three weeks or four since we last um, discussed it and we were going to um, maybe do a, um, a review of some uh, quick fixes that we can uh, make with our process, with our um, checklist of what's required to get in front of us for site plan approval and um, going through these applications. It just reminded me of how important that is because it's, we have to make it easier for um, business owners, restaurants, retail shops, developers to find out sooner rather than later that we don't like their balcony, that we don't like their garage uh, distance from the street, while they're still waiting and negotiating for other um, county level items. And they can work on those things while we at least give them our input and our review. Um, so. I look forward to continuing those conversations and to seeing that next development workshop come up. Um, I wanted to congratulate all the award recipients that uh, came tonight and, and thank the sponsors and the volunteers who participated in any way to make these activities and experiences possible for the children of our community. They're learning about responsibility, about commitment, good sportsmanship, failure, and success. So these are great, great valuable skills that our, our kids are learning. And the goal for tonight, for the presentation, was to let them hear that we recognize them, that we see them, and that we appreciate their efforts, and that the parents see that as well. And so hopefully after they finish school and they go to college and, and they're done, that they consider coming back to Homestead and serving their community and, and giving back and keeping their talent where they found it. Uh, so hopefully that seed has been planted and we can um, enjoy that fruit in the future. Also, uh, getting ready for back to school. I want to thank all the local organizations that have provided funding or that have provided the programming for the summer, uh, summer quality activities for our parents to be able to use, uh, drop the kids off and continue working throughout the day. And as that's coming to an end, I want to thank uh, all of the partners that have helped with the supplies giveaways. I've done two in my district so far where we've given out over 200 book bags and school supplies, free meals for kids and families, and a special thank you to South Dade Venture CDD at Waterstone and Property Manager GMS for accommodating those activities. 
Thank you to Councilman Roth, to Councilwoman Bailey, to Councilman Fletcher for their contributions to making these events possible. Thank you to all the community sponsors, organizations, and individuals who donated paper, pencil, backpacks, crayons, all these items, including Brandy Ramirez, Flora Zuaga from the Women's Club, Linda Fagan, Jeff Porter, Muhead Organization, Men Molding Men, CHI, CHI, State House Representative Kevin Chambliss and staff. There's so many partners that are coming together and there are more to come. We have another event on August 21st, which is this Saturday off of uh, Campbell Drive around the Checkers location that will be beginning at noon until supplies run out. So you can um, head out to there. There are still opportunities to get school supplies. And I just came back from Florida League of Cities and I wanted to make sure that I went. I wasn't able to go last year because of COVID. And so when the opportunity came up, I said, let's go. It was great to have Councilwoman Bailey in the crowd. I couldn't talk to her much, obviously, but it was uh, great to be around familiar people and um, in a safe environment. I met with representatives offering solutions for waste management, recycling, nature vendors. Uh, we talked about the Rails to Trails program. I have not given up on that. So hopefully that will come to fruition soon. Uh, we talked about um, downtown consultants, professionals in youth tourism, um, many visionaries who have already spoken with our CRA directors. So I think that the resources are out there. We just have to tap into them and uh, take a leap of faith and momentum cures everything. As you see, we started the conversation with uh, Homestead Old City Hall and more applications and more interest is coming around. So. If we want to see our downtown grow, we need to continue this trend. Um, there was an inspiring guest speaker, and I'm bringing home a lot of ideas and new visions, uh, including ways to engage our community and on how to be more active with legislation and elections, as we've discussed in the past. But before I went to FLC, I stopped at Naples, Naples downtown, which was very exciting. I had mentioned that I wanted to do that, and they have a very robust downtown, very similar to what I think our old Chrome Avenue downtown looks like. Um, they have restaurants and they have shops, uh, but they have residences. And those buildings don't exceed three to four stories. And it was charming, it was beautiful, it was inviting. The architecture was, was um, a variety of different types of styles of buildings. And of course they have the beach, which we don't have to attract. But there are plenty of downtowns around the nation that don't have a beach and that are serving the residents of their community. And so while, while we don't have a beach uh, and we can't offer that, we can still offer mini parks, we can offer artwork around downtown, we can offer manicured landscaping, we can keep our streets clean. We can do these things. And, and the other thing I saw were American flags on almost every pole on every building. So. These are things that we can do now that we don't have to wait for big box companies to come into downtown and make our downtown thriving. These are things that are in our control. And there's no lack of nurseries or landscape artists in our, in our city, so let's connect with these businesses and ask them to help us come up with design, come up, come up with concepts. So it was very inspiring to go to Naples. I think that um, this is something that you guys should also consider and I look forward to going around other places in our South Florida area to um, get more inspiration on too. And without further ado, I do have a resolution under my agenda item, and this is being brought to you all for consideration. You know, we're a military town. We're one of the oldest cities in Dade County. And you know, what is our brand? What is our, 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 our our calling here? Is it patriotism? Is it um, um, being a, a military community? Maybe, maybe not, but either way, there's many flags you can fly. Uh, but let's start with the American flag, and I encourage us to um, make sure that we're showing the community that we encourage the display of the American flag, especially right now as we come up with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and everything that's going on with uh, commu communism around the world and terrorism. It's a bold stand, but it's just a reminder, a friendly reminder that we encourage it. And so I, I ask my colleagues to support this resolution tonight. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I don't know, do we need a staff report? I mean, it, it seems pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pearl. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor. This is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, supporting the display of American flags by residents and businesses within the City of Homestead, providing for implementation, providing for an effective date. Okay, so I'm going to assume that Councilwoman Avila will be the movement of this item. And, Thank you, uh, Mayor. We'll all be co-secondors of your your motion. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak on this honor? Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to say real quick a shout out to my son's previous Boy Scout Pack 69. They spent the last couple years looking for flags that needed to be replaced. They did a beautiful ceremony, explained to the schools or the businesses how they can properly retire a flag. So I'm not sure how many more they are willing to do, but for my colleagues, if you see any that are in really sad shape, um, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm sure that they would love to, to continue that beautiful tradition. Thank you. Very good, thank you. All right, so, and uh, we've, we've all seconded the, uh, the motion. Let's have a roll call vote, resolution. Councilman Shelley? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Raw? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Mayor Lawson? Yes. The motion carries. Thank, thank you. you. Councilman Fletcher, you're up. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I won't take up too much time. I just wanted to apologize for not being there in person this evening, but I am out uh, on COVID protocols with some symptoms. Uh, hopefully that will all be cleared up here in the next uh, few days. Uh, but uh, I did want to uh, remind everybody that uh, there's still a national pandemic out there. We need to be looking out for ourselves and our neighbors. Uh, let's reach out to those who we can provide help to if they need assistance to uh, get to a vaccination location or if they need assistance getting their groceries if they're unable to go out. Let's, uh, let's all reach out to those folks and uh, lend that extra helping hand we need to do right now. Uh, with that, I also will uh, uh, offer my condolences to your family, Mr. Lozner. Uh, your dad was a, a true pioneer for this community, and uh, he will be sorely missed. And that's all I have for tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Thank you Councilman Fletcher. Councilman Shelley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess just one, one quick item, and, and it kind of piggybacks on what Councilwoman Avila had mentioned regarding kind of the development services. I know that, you know, for some of the items that were deferred, during my conversations with um, with Joe, with Ms. Cordino, you know, there was a different process that I guess had been followed with those particular applicants where you kind of bifurcated or, or a methodology of trying to expedite um, that process, you know, so I don't necessarily want to get into the merits of, of the applications themselves, but as far as the process itself, I don't know if you could better explain kind of what, where that is. And again, I know we may have a, a workshop coming up. Maybe that's a better venue, but, but I at least wanted to give you an opportunity to kind of explain what, what we did this time around differently. Yes, sir, I, I, can, I can briefly explain that. I, you know, I, it, I've, I've been listening, obviously, to what, what's been said, and the mayor had a, a workshop with us or a meeting with us in January where we went over some of the perceived um, issues with the department relative to friendliness or discretion or uh, the ability to expedite uh, projects through the system. So after that meeting, I took the, the very next um, application to come through the door, and I thought, okay, let me, let me see if we can't try a different approach. And, and so uh, instead of necessarily going through the, the, uh, the typical approach in the code where you go uh, receive a complete application, do the DRC review, planning and zoning board, uh, City Council, we decide, okay, we'll do kind of do a rolling uh, review of the application. So, um, you know, if the application wasn't complete, we were just going to take it, uh, review it as quickly as possible, get comments back, and see if we couldn't make any headway with that. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about discretion, so, uh, you know, somebody said, okay, you guys are not using all the discretion you can, and maybe you're, you're, you're slowing things down, either obstructing or slowing things down. So in this one, we said, okay, we've got an application. It's, it's got to go through. Let's, let's, let's quote, unquote, use all the discretion we have. We've got incomplete items with a traffic study, a, a survey, a lot of things from the city's perspective. But let's figure those don't really mean a whole lot to the actual site plan. You can put a site plan up, and, and you can work the traffic out later. Let's make conditions 
for those types of, of things that they're working on um, maybe a little slower than normal. We wouldn't typically put something on the agenda without the traffic review being mitigated. So we advertised uh, these things, we put them on the agenda, and we had a couple of issues that are not within our control. These are the county controls. In, in one instance, the applicant had worked and, and, and got a, a kind of a verbal agreement with Miami-Dade County for, for school board medication. In the other instance, the applicant hadn't even met with Miami-Dade County yet. So we waited for those agreements to come in, but, but we simply ran out of time. The, the agenda was published, and when we were deciding whether we could hear or not hear the applications, um, you know, there were some things we found out that we did have the ability to condition, and some things we didn't. And that's where we ran into the roadblocks tonight. We just simply couldn't um, legally put those, hear those items without those conditions being satisfied. So, you know, I, I, I guess my issue when we get into the workshop is, you know, I, I would like some more clear direction on how you all would like to see these things presented. This time, um, through our experiment, it was relatively piecemeal. There were a bunch of things that were incomplete. For instance, we don't know what the traffic mitigation is. We don't know what the level of service on the roads are. We don't know if they'll have to pay into it. Um, the survey wasn't complete, so we don't know about the, the plat. There's a lot of unknowns, um, and so do you prefer to, to, to kind of hurry those things along and put them on the agenda and then go back and clean up the details later, um, which I think you were suggesting, or, or do you prefer in the traditional way, which the, you know, we typically have uh, a, a, uh, a full complete application in all, in all set, in, in all categories, and then move forward. Um, there's been a lot of talk about discretion. The development service really doesn't have discretion. Discretion's mentioned five times in the entire code relative to development services, and it's um, and it and it it almost never deals with uh, um, you know it, it's it, it never deals with allowing things to necessarily move faster. You can uh, relieve a bond if somebody plants a tree in the right place, or you can dis, dis, have discretion over providing a courtesy notice or something. But it doesn't tell us you can not accept uh, an application or you can uh, only piecemeal take applications, right? So either way, that's, I, th I think that's um, kind of, kind of uh, information about the applications that went forward. You see they were complicated. Each of them had seven different uh, uh, sub-applications with them. And when we found that when we're reviewing them randomly and piecemeal, it can be utterly confusing and I think actually slows the process down more. Um, but that's what I need direction on. How do you prefer that you see these things uh, come to you? And thank you, Joe, and, and, and thank you guys for letting me ask the question. I know we've had a long night, but I just, having my conversations with him leading up to today's meeting, you know, I could, I could sense some of the frustration in the department as far as they're doing the best they can to try to work within the bounds in which they are combined by. And then, you know, speaking to him as well about how this piecemeal process, although it seemed like a good idea to start because it seemed like we could get these applicants through the process faster, it, it somewhat actually made it more complicated for us to evaluate, but also more complicated for the applicants themselves because in theory, you condition it on a traffic study or some sort of thing, you get them through the process, they get approved only to find out that it's gonna require some sort of you know, large unexpected expenditure by the applicant. Now they've already spent all this money to go through the process to then find out at the end that things beyond our control ultimately cost them more money and they probably, they may or may not complete the process. So, you know, it's a, it's a thing where I think there's pros and cons for each. I don't, I don't have a specific position on what the answer is, uh, but I at least wanted to give Joe a chance to maybe kind of present some of that and, and hopefully we can, either through a workshop or otherwise, give him and the rest of our staff some more clear direction on what we, what we want exactly, how we want it to proceed, um, so that going forward we can make sure, again, that we are friendly, developer friendly, uh, but also have rules and regulations so that there's a process and a procedure. So thank you, Joe, for giving that, and thank you guys for, for accommodating me. That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, real quick. And in that regard, these two cases tonight may be a good case study for Council to let Joe walk us through the process from the moment someone comes in with a potential project. And let's let's be familiar with the forks in the road and and those external approvals and, and items that that our department needs to have in order to continue this forward. So I think that you know the two 
deferrals tonight may be really good case studies as to, to how that process works and, and you know, what, what went wrong, if you will, and I'm you know, just what, what, what derailed tonight's hearings. And is there anything that can be done to remedy that and, and not impede you know, your office and continuing to go forward? I think I think the uh, the process, as it's stated in the code, uh, is an applicant comes into the department and they uh, they do a pre-application hearing. At that point in time, we provide them a checklist uh, based on everything that they want to do, right? And then they go put their stuff, and we tell them what it's going to cost. You know, the, the all, all the application fees and the cost recovery fees and all those things, and, and those are set with flat rates that we developed over a decade ago. They, have, they haven't really changed at all. So the applicant then typically comes in uh, with, the, with the package. This was pre-COVID. They'll, they'll, they'll give us the package and we would then do a, a checklist review. Okay, we said site plan, got your site plan. We said traffic study, you got your traffic study. Da, da, da. Go down, check mark it off, say okay, the application is complete and then we begin the review. And we give it to the planners or the we give it to the department heads and then they they review the entire package, and then they uh, then we have the development review committee meeting. That's really the staff work. In in the cases that we're dealing with now, um, it, it's it's not one application. As you can see tonight, we had close to 30 on the agenda. They may have been for four, but we, you know it's it's kind of rare you see uh, applicants with seven or eight different items on it. And so at that point in time, you're into you know you're reviewing not one application, but you're viewing seven for, you know, X amount of applicants. Now you're doing 30. And that's where we run in, that's where we run into the resource problem. And that's what's hit us in, in the, in the spring and summer of this year, completely a resource issue. It's like, how do you get all this stuff done? So we do the development review committee meeting and we, theoretically, the applicant wouldn't move to the planning and zoning board meeting until the application all the comments had been addressed. So uh, what you get is, did the applicant submit the traffic study? Did they address the comments in the traffic study? And then they don't move forward. What, what we've had in, in instances recently are applicants not submitting complete applications. And therefore, things lag behind. And we don't like to put them forward without having all that stuff, because I think it's confusing to us. We'll drop the ball. Uh, or something, and I think it's confusing to the decision makers not having complete packages. In these cases, and we're trying to be, I don't know what it means, but business friendly, we're saying, okay, go ahead, and we're getting a lot of pressure from the applicants, go ahead and get to the planning and zoning board without this stuff. You really, really, you can't get approved without the stuff. It's got to be approved ultimately in the first place, meaning it's got to go through the planning and zoning board, it's got to go to the city council. Um, you would just be seeing it in you know after you may have approved the site plan and so uh, this case what we did is in, in we we have the ability to condition those things and so we experimented with conditioning them right and and one of the reasons we did it is because you know we heard what we, we heard what was said during the the meeting that we had in January and you know we're under a lot of pressure from the applicants who are you know, that we're, you're obstructing us from going through. You don't like it. We don't take value judgments on the development, right? It fits the code or it doesn't fit the code. And, you know, it's not something that we like or don't like. If it's, if it's too tall, it's too tall. If it's uh, too dense, it's too dense. Um, and so this time we put those things forward using, quote unquote, discretion to condition the things that we didn't have. Um, I don't think, you know, from a staff perspective that they, they I think they would all they, they don't like me for that very much right now because I think it put a lot of pressure on them uh, and um, it was very confusing. But we did it and the issue was, okay, where is this really getting hung up? This, is, this stuff is getting hung up on things that we don't control. We don't control derm, we don't control fire, we don't control school board, we don't control county traffic. There's a Publix applicant that I think has been in county traffic since the spring and likely won't be done till October. Um, so, you know, I don't know, we, we can't control that. I know that we're getting blamed for all of those things, but they're not uh, things that we can control. And so uh, we use our discretion, we put it up on the board, 
and this, this is the result of it. Even if they would have been heard tonight, obviously they couldn't be approved until the concurrency came through and the, and the fire reviewed it and the Durham reviewed it and all of those things. So the typical process is to wait until the entire application is complete and reviewed and addressed. After that DRC process, um, it goes to planning and zoning, then the city council, and then it's a neat, nice, tight package that you could, you know, typically in the DRC, we've worked out everything, it's ready to be approved. In some instances, remember the 7-Eleven years ago, the applicant had no desire to work through a development service process. They had seven variances, and they basically said, I, I want to take my chance with the city council. In, in those cases come up rarely, and in those cases we'll say, okay, you can go forward, but you'll go forward with staff denials, because we can't work out the issues between staff, and we won't hold them up into a process making them conform to conditions or, or uh, regulations that they, they don't want to meet, right? So, you know, we stop those. If they want to work with us, we'll work with them to get a provable project. If not, then we can move them forward to city council or planning and zoning, and that's where they come across with denials, because we just ran into roadblocks on the variances or things like that. So that's essentially the process in a nutshell. What we've practiced here consistently throughout the 11 years I've been here is the, uh, is the complete package. And it tells us to do that in the code. It tells us to do the complete package in the code and move forward. So this was an experiment. Um, and I'm interested to see what you thought of the experiment and if you preferred it or not so that I can conduct myself in that way. Because I, I can plan and, and manage the department the way you all want me to do it but I need more clear direction on exactly how you want me to do it. And I sense that there are maybe different ways. Some would like to see completeness, some would like to see flexibility and speed. And thank you. Well, You're welcome. clearly we've got a lot of workshop work to do. All right, um, Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. I reached out to Chefs on the Run again just to see how they were doing, and apparently the county put in some trees that are now causing more clogging because of all the leaves. Yeah, I, I know that the county had made some improvements there, and we've also requested a survey so we can see exactly where the city ends and if what, if anything, we can do to help alleviate the flooding situation. But I did not know that what they did was causing more of a problem. Maybe that gives us a little extra leverage to say there's a drainage problem, it's right here between our lines, how can you help? Yeah, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with the survey, so we can look at it and say, here's what we can do to help. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and speaking of still being in a pandemic, I would like to thank our staff for reacting so quickly. I went to Harris Field yesterday to get tested. I was in line for almost three hours I witnessed four, I, I witnessed three people faint while waiting in line. One was being taken care of as soon as I got close to the pavilion and it just felt, it felt like end of days. It was twilight zone like. Um, and I called city manager's office and right away the police were there, um, coolers full of water. Um, so just a big reminder, even if it doesn't feel so hot, it just, it look, people were falling like flies. It was, it gets really bad really quickly. Big reminder, no children in the car ever when you're stepping out. Um, look after our, our seniors. It is a very serious thing when you're already not feeling well. That was a really bad combination and thank you for reacting so quickly. Um, one more thing on behalf of Lawanda Bragg of Courtney Vega Foundation. She was not able to be here tonight, but I would love to ask my colleagues if you could please help, if you're able, to c cover her cost fees. This is going to be the sixth annual sickle cell walk. She has done amazing things in the community by um, raising awareness. It's only $510. It will be at... It will, sorry, it will be at Roscoe Warren, and I will have a flyer to share with everyone, but I would really appreciate anybody who's able to help cover those costs. I know that it's always a great event and brings lots of awareness. 
The very last thing is most of us have our first day of school this coming Monday. So a reminder to teachers to have patience with your children. Children have patience with your teachers. Everybody have patience and have fun and enjoy each other and wash your hands and keep your mask on um, and keep checking in on your neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, has the vice mayor joined us? No, okay. All right, I have two quick, hopefully two fairly quick items tonight. The first is the announcement of the existence of two vacancies on the Southwest Advisory Committee, and I would ask that the clerk post that on the website. And uh, for those who are watching or listening, um, please help spread the word that there is that opportunity for service on that committee. Finally, and, and this is related to, I guess, the last workshop we had, which was sort of a development services, um, comp plan overview, and rapid transit zone issues that, uh, that are still uh, percolating out there. I came away from that meeting with the perception that um, I know for myself that the intensity and heights that are permitted generally in the downtown at this point under the existing code may not be something that a lot of us are particularly happy with at this point as the city and development has evolved. And um, I think that we perhaps maybe because we're the last frontier or that we unwittingly open the door for folks to be looking at, at the area, that um, there seems to be a lot of interest in what, what can be done in terms of a residential in our, in our downtown core, as well as being faced with the pressure of this proposed RTZ ordinance that we're going to have to deal with and perhaps make some adjustments. I wanted to open the conversation about whether or not we'd like to have our staff begin crafting a, a moratorium on some residential development in the area bounded uh, to the north by Campbell Drive, to the south by the city limits at Lucy Street, US 1 to the east, and basically 2nd Avenue to the west. Basically what we consider the, the greater downtown core. And um, carve out an exception for city-owned property, certainly since we are still negotiating for our uh, having good faith discussions with proposers that responded to us. I don't think it's fair to, to lock that down. It's not to say that we have to do a deal with any of those proposers, but I, I think it really sends a, a conflicting message um, so that things don't get out of our control. As I said earlier, I think folks are looking at properties that have been dormant for a while, and once something is uh, developed or an application comes in, I think our, our hands are tied, and I fear that we're gonna miss some opportunity to make some adjustments to, to better uh, locate intensity and height and product. Uh, I think Councilwoman, you talked about kind of an inverse pyramid coming from US-1 with, with high and going lower as we come to the downtown. That may give us the opportunity to, to do that. And I just, I wanted to put this item on the agenda to hear your thoughts as to whether or not we wanted to, to move forward to begin acting some, enacting some safeguards to give us some breathing room to, to, to reevaluate uh, what our you know, our evolved vision might be for that, that area. So I'd, I'd welcome some input and comments on that. Councilwoman? A moratorium is for how long? Minimum or maximum? Typically um, up to one year. Certainly if, if we come to agreement, it could be uh, terminated earlier, but typically one year with usually not more than than one or two um, extensions. Um, it's, it's not a long-term solution, but I fear that if we, we don't take some action, 
uh, the future of our downtown and the Chrome and US-1 corridor will be out of our control under the current, current code. Can we accomplish um, the same thing by rezoning or not rezoning, but um, recoding so that we essentially set the stage for the height requirements we want? Let's just do that. that that's now. the idea of the moratorium to, to give us time to enact those adjustments because without the moratorium, Conceivably, and jump in here if I get too far off the rails, Mr. Pearl. Someone could come in with a proposal for a project that they have the right to do as a matter of right under the current code that may really not be compatible with what our, our current ideas are for development in and around the greater downtown. Mr. Pearl? As it is, if somebody comes in and does it as a matter of right, I think the purpose of the moratorium is to establish what the parameters you want to be for development around the area. And I know that James has spoken about this pretty extensively at the, at the workshops and the details and the considerations that have to go in in terms of timing, what would be acceptable, um, where we're drawing our line in the sand, and I don't know that we ever got clear direction on that, James. If, I, I don't know that in the past we've had the discussion on a moratorium targeted to the downtown. I think we were talking more globally, globally. Okay. You know, typically looking sure. at those areas outside generally the DRI on the east side. But for me, this, this is a very targeted uh, effort so that, that we, we've got that breathing room and aren't threatened by applications that uh, – we, we may not be thrilled with as, as time goes on. Uh, that, that was my thought process. Thank you, Mr. Pearl. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll weigh in a little bit. Um, I, I mean, I think for me, and again, I, I missed some of those workshops you guys had, so there may be some information that was discussed that I've, I'm not up to speed on. Um, you know, I would like, I guess, as part of any type of evaluation, maybe some uh, a summation of, of what the current density is and the current, you know, what's allowed in the downtown of this particular region that you've outlined, you know, what could go there uh, so I can better determine whether I am, am or am or am not okay with what's currently planned. That's in the handout. I don't know if you have it. The, if you look here in uh, Councilman Fletcher's spot, you should have one. It's two pages that kind of talk of the, the color right here. It's not, it, it was not in the agenda. It was handed out prior to the meeting. There you go. That, that kind of talks about the, the potential at this point, uh, layers in, you know, the worst case scenario under the RTZ. Okay, uh, yeah, and, and I guess, and I saw this, I did kind of cru cruise through it when I, I sat down tonight and looked at it, but it seemed like it more of a generalization versus, you know, what, what is exactly allowed, I guess, in, you know, in our R3, the heights and all, all of that so that I could better determine, because I know we've had discussions leading up till, till now, you know, of, of whether or not we needed to add more density in there, which is part, of, I guess, this discussion of, of a moratorium and what we're going to have the downtown actually look like. Is it, you know, is the vision now to keep it more of a low-key low old downtown? Is it still to put density in there so it's a live-work-play area? You know, I think those are things to be discussed. Um, I know originally when we talked about a moratorium, you know, I, I was supportive of a moratorium citywide with some carve-outs, and one of those carve-outs was kind of the downtown because of that. And I'm still kind of of that position now where I don't really want to lock the downtown from development because I think that further discourages people. Once they see that word moratorium, uh, it could further discourage anybody even being interested in looking at developing the downtown, which, again, I, I, I think as you guys all discussed, we're already having some issues after COVID here of getting, getting that interest picked back up again. So those would be some of my concerns. You know, and again, maybe, maybe staff can provide me a sum, better summation of exactly how what the current plan is, you know, I think we have a downtown, you know, master plan a little bit too that ties in an overlay district over on top of some of this other stuff. So, you know, that would be helpful for me in assessing what we currently are allowed to do there and what the current plan looks like. And if, it, if it's completely haphazard, then obviously that makes more sense to maybe reset. But again, the concern is once you put that moratorium word down there, all of a sudden any chance of development 
you know, maybe completely gone because they don't know they don't know what it's going to look like in the future at that point. So th those would be my concerns on the downtown moratorium. You know, and, and clearly there are carve outs for a moratorium. And my, you know, my immediate concern is what I feel is very liberal height allowances in the core downtown. It, it's kind of my opinion that maybe they ought to be moved a couple of blocks away from down. You know, maybe. Maybe five stories a couple of blocks off Chrome to the east is more appropriate than overshadowing our street. And I think we've all had conversations and even your conversation tonight about three story perhaps may, may be more appropriate to maintain the charm of our, you know, turn of the 20th century uh, downtown feel rather than, than towering over the streets. That's really, you know, my, my biggest concern, not necessarily, well, Certainly, density is tied to height, but you know my concern is is the I guess the scope and scale that is currently permitted on Chrome and on and on Washington was was my my concern, and and certainly you know a moratorium you know I, again I would think we could we could build in those exceptions uh, for those for those products that come in in the interim that that we would find acceptable. So, and, you know, there are five of us here tonight, and now three of us have, have indicated that they don't like the word moratorium, so let's either end the discussion or, or go forward. Uh, can't say it didn't for lack of trying. I think the spirit of the of the item is that we need to do something, we need to do it quickly, so I, I think that what I, what I want to support is moving forward with the workshops. Let's have our development services and our attorneys carve out the plan for what we want it to look like so we can establish that and encourage that. You know, momentum cures everything, and I feel like this would stop that momentum. And okay, if by minimum you mean min momentum, you mean five stories on Chrome Avenue and throughout that huge parcel that fronts both Chrome and US-1, that's not the kind of momentum I support for this community. I, I agree, but I think that we can achieve a result that we do want by moving forward with our development services plans to rezone and change the code so that we encourage the development we do want. If, we're, if we don't want five stories on Chrome Avenue, then let's change that. Right I now. understand your lack of institutional history here, but pending a rezoning, Someone can come in and put in an application under the old code. Unless Mr. Pearl tells me differently, the only thing that will protect us from that is a moratorium situation. Rezonings, remaster planning take a long time. And in that interim, and, and that's what we would do under the, the, the protection, the umbrella protection of a moratorium, we would do that, but without a moratorium, working forward uh, with those items does does not give us that protection from applications. No, sorry, Mr. <laughs> no, Ms. if someone came in and processed presented us with an application today, it would be processed in accordance with the, the code as it's written, to be sure. So, yeah. <laughs> and a, a, the enactment of a moratorium would allow us not to be subject to the threat of that while we reevaluated the overlays for the greater downtown. Is that a fair assessment? That, may, may, I can chime in, that is. I mean. The, a moratorium is just one of the tools that I've said before that it's in your toolbox for growth management. It allows you to press the pause button so that you can evaluate an area <clears throat> uh, within the city or areas in the city um, with respect to the current uh, structure that you have in place with the future land use, with your zoning categories, um, and evaluate the intensities, the densities, um, the height, all of those variables that deal with uh, land development regulations as we 
categorize them broadly. And, um, you know, depending on how you all want to set it up, um, you can set par parameters or bars as to who's in and who's out, right? Um, and who's captured by the moratorium or who's allowed to proceed. Um, but at some point, it does stop new applications from coming in to give you all an opportunity to examine, review, workshop, decide uh, what changes, if any, you ultimately want to make. Um, they're usually for a year, based on case law. If you're able to show that you've got something pending and you just haven't made it to, you know, the P and Z and then council for review, we can extend it up to another six months. And I still feel that that's a safe zone, um, as long as we're able to show that we've made consistent study and effort. At the end of the moratorium period, either you've going to have changes or you're not going to have changes. It doesn't mean that you are. It just gives you the opportunity to do those things. Um, but if you don't have that in place, then the rule under Florida law is that whatever the law is on the books at the time the application comes before you is the law that applies. Thank you. So I'll leave it to my colleagues as to whether or not we're going to leave the future of downtown to chance under the current code or we're going to try to uh, examine and make some adjustments. Councilman Roth. I think everybody knows how I feel uh, about moratoriums and I, I don't think that that's the right thing to do right now. Um, I mean, we can look at uh, history and the city's been here 100 years and no one's made application to put up a five-story building on Chrome Avenue to date. So I just don't know that that moratorium is the right thing. I mean, if we want to examine and look at restricting five-story buildings along Chrome Avenue, that's one thing. But to blanket this area with a moratorium, I think uh, disrupts uh, conversation with developers that may want to come in and explore what we want them to do there. So I just, I can't support a moratorium uh, at this time. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate your input. Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if we would vote tonight on excluding any five-story buildings on Chrome Avenue, that would be an easy one for me. Um, the historic part of downtown, obviously that can't be touched, correct? Matt, Joe. So you have a national historic district, which is recognized pursuant to federal law but under your current local historic preservation ordinance, um, you don't have a local historic district designation. And the only way that you have protection over an individual landmark property, historically designated property, or a district is to establish that, and that gives you the ability to, um, anytime you touch that or to make changes to it, that's where your historic preservation board comes in. And um, the applications, which we call certificates of appropriateness. Um, if somebody wanted to d demolish a, a historic building or a contributing building in a designated district, um, those are the types of applications that would need to come before the historic preservation board. And ultimately, if someone was not happy with that decision, it would come to you all for an appeal. Um, so I know there's a lot of confusion on that, but yes, you have a historic, a national register historic landmark downtown, but you don't have the local designation of that district, which would give protection of not changing the character or not changing the building or not changing everything. You, you may have a few dotted local historic buildings that you couldn't touch the facade on, but n not the entire district. And that district, I believe, the National Historic District, is a different boundary than what I think the mayor is suggesting. 
and is a different boundary than your, his, your historic downtown area for purposes of extended hours of operation uh, for alcohol and for hours of operation. So they're all a little bit different, and I know it can get confusing, but to answer your question about the historic district, it's, it's the local district that provides the protection, which you don't have. And there wouldn't, uh, there wouldn't be any halfway point where anything in this area came before us instead of having a moratorium? Is that something that we could? I mean, uh, other than changing, I mean, other than figuring out what you all want to do, right, with, with comp plan and then your zoning regulations, um, I mean, you always have the ability to look at that, to look at those and make modifications or changes from a comp plan perspective, legislatively, or from a zoning perspective. Um, and, and we can certainly look at that and workshop that and go through that procedure um, and make whatever changes you all as a body feel you'd like to make. And then, you know, we could advise you along the way with regards to that. But I mean, I would caution that you know, anytime we start looking at major changes with you know, decreasing rights that are already there, we have to take into consideration what those negative implications might be with respect to lawsuits, things of that nature. Not that that would occur, but I think you, know, you, have, to, you have to look at it holistically. And you have lots of pieces on the puzzle here, right? Lots of different zoning categories and uh, future land use categories that don't exactly all match. I mean, you have like the downtown corridor along Chrome, then you go out a little bit. And I mean, I, you know, you, I, from based on previous conversations, I don't think you all have ever made it to defining exactly what you want the downtown to be. You know, you've had lots of conversations. And so, you know, maybe that conversation is the next step, right? You know, to, to piggyback on the last presentation that Mr. Cordino made to you all, um, basically showing you what the county's proposal is. Um, you know, I certainly think that, you know, those conversations are relevant to what you're doing now. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of you all deciding how you want to proceed. And a moratorium wouldn't exclude any county ordinance, correct? Well, you. I'm not sure I understand. If we were to if we were to put a moratorium for the city, that wouldn't exclude if the county were to pass a certain density that they were asking. Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know the exact answer, but I think that the way that the county ordinance is structured right now, um, it wouldn't necessarily take effect, Joe. Right until there there is real. There is no, not even necessarily a proposed county ordinance. There is an idea that had come across from the from County Commissioner Gilbert, but it's not been a workshop through a committee yet, and it's not been placed on any county commission agenda for review or discussion. So it, it merely, right now, is an idea. And um, from what I understand of it, it's a very unpopular idea. Uh, not only because it increases density in places that don't want the density, but it, it also, in concept, would take control of the local uh, governments to review and approve their own land use and zoning. So it's got, it's got a lot of issues that I think uh, almost every city uh, would push back on um, in its current forms. But, but uh, that is a work in process that likely will either disappear or Go, and, and I think all the cities, right, Mayor, are way ahead of seeing, we'll know when this starts to change without, it won't be a surprise. So, I, so I, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I think that if you were to proceed pretty quickly with a moratorium, then that would likely not interfere with what's happening at the county. And, it, it, and even if there was some crossover time, I think it would give us the ability to, to examine that more closely. But currently, it's just an idea. How long that will take or what, what that might morph into remains to be seen. And so while you have that going on, you still have your downtown.
And, you know, notwithstanding what that might be, there, there are areas downtown that aren't going to be covered or necessarily within the circle of what the county's trying to do. Thank you, James. Yeah. Well, first, let's uh, have a motion to extend the meeting to 915. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey. We have a second to extend to 915. Second by Councilman Roth. All in favor? Any opposed? I guess what I'm getting at, and I think, James, you hit on it, is, is the visioning thing. And at the last workshop, there were items that were brought to my attention that certainly not my preferred vision, and I got the sense that some of us in that meeting shared that sentiment. And again, I guess the moratorium gives us the ability to craft that vision without the threat of contrary applications coming before us. Mr. Pearl? Uh, no, I'm... James? Is that a fair assessment? That, that's a fair assessment, Mayor. All right. A and let's go find a thesaurus and find a different word for moratorium, but it is what it is, and in my view, without that, we can start to do all the, the new overlays and designations we want, but we have nothing to protect us from applications coming in or, uh, you know, folks coming in and claiming vested rights with, without that uh, moratorium. But I, I just don't get the sense that there's any sympathy for, uh, for creating that protection. Now let's, you know. Those of you who have, have spoken against that, if, if I'm reading you wrong, let's go forward or go home. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Council Fletcher. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just, so I'm in real strong agreement with what, what you're proposing here because I typically just take a look at just north of the city limits of Homestead on US-1, and I see these, you know, large behemoths right on the roadway on US-1, and I fear that that at some point in time, one of these landowners or developers are going to come down here and do this to us, and we're going to be stuck without anywhere to go when it comes to their vested rights on their property. You know, right now we have a seven-story designation in a lot of our locations. We talked about it with one applicant tonight where he's going to proffer where he won't go over three stories. Uh, I am a proponent of this, uh, this activity, and I believe that uh, we need to act quickly to ensure that we're able to control uh, our destiny long-term at the city of Homestead. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Just so you know, Councilman, I've got a lot of silence and blank stares here. So maybe you and I will be in position when the guy comes in to redevelop that old trailer park down on South Chrome at seven stories and 30 units to the acre. It's not going to help the future and our legacy, but, uh, you know, we get to say I told you so because I see this is going nowhere. As, so, thank you, Councilman Fletcher. If there's nothing further, then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councilman Roth. We have a second. Thank you all. Good night.